Hello, this is uh, Robert Merchek from uh, Brooklyn, New York in the USA, reminding you that you are watching the Scene World podcast. Hello, welcome to the Scene World podcast. Hi, guys. This is Martin Arman, and I'm Jörg. There's uh, Jörg Drüge. <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> and um, seeing our little cute cuddle bear means AJ is busy with other things. So we have Martin here for the news. And um, but before we before we go to the interview part, um, let's let's talk about the news. Our guest for today, by the way, is Triforce Johnson. He is the leading force about e-gaming in Jamaica. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and this is part one of the two-parted interview because um, part one turned out about his history and, um, well, how to say, um, his participation in the American um, arcade scene with Walter Day and Tim and how he met them and so on. So we made a second part and that is coming out end of April. So this is part one coming out in the middle of April. So mm -hmm. like your little your little um, Easter egg, <laughs> so to speak. Alrighty. So what have we missed in the last four weeks? Well, um, for once, There is this new joystick called Unistor from Unijoy, a Polish company that is working on a new joystick uh, with a DZAP 9 DB connector for the Amiga C64 Atari. And um, they released a new video. Oh, Cook shit. with Unijoy. <laughs> um, <laughs> how to make a good schnitzel with, with Unitro, <laughs> you know? Yeah. <laughs> uh, be a real solid thing of uh, hardware then. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And they also made another video, which we also will link to, uh, which is a gameplay video of the USB version of the Unistore from Unitroy. Because um, some people, of course, were concerned about the USB timing lag that, you know, the original uh, Competition Pro USB version had, for example. Yes. And um, they always said, like, no, we don't have this issue. So there is a gameplay video about that. So watch, watch that if you like. And the other news is, a few years ago, we had an interview with Ron Gilbert. And um, in this interview about Thimbleweed Park, yeah. his latest um, point-and-click adventure back then. And during this interview, he also mentioned that most likely, when asked, there will be no new Monkey Island because he thought that um, Walt Disney probably won't take usage of the Lucasfilm games and LucasArts license and make a successor <clears throat> to or allow a successor in license of the original Monkey Island. And it appeared that for the last two years, Ron Gilbert and Dave uh, Gossman secretly, without telling anybody, worked on a new Monkey Island, which will be a successor of the first two Monkey Islands. Well, they are ignoring all the successor other Monkey Islands they weren't involved with. And so, for uh, to our surprise, um, Walt Disney actually um, recreated the studio, and now there is Lucasfilm Games again. And um, there was actually a sign for that, because a few months back, Disney actually started selling all... Disney Studio games they made for the PC as a collection on Steam. Oh. Before I... they were all delisted, you know. Uh -huh. Because, as we know, Disney was more focusing on the movie part of sure. uh, Lucasfilm. 
Mm-hmm. You know, with the Star Wars movie and so on, and now they decided to actually do something. So I guess the step of um, reselling and offering the games from 2011 again as a collection on Steam, so you could buy them separately, of course, if you like, um, is was a sign that Disney will go back to the um, to the video game business. Oh. So. There is a little trailer for that, and people already commented they don't like the graphic style of the new game. But I would say, let's let's see about that. You know. Um, well, I'm excited if uh, if they will uh, if they try to to have a, another part um, uh, which which will take part after part two of Monkey Island, which I have a strong connection to. I don't know if you know it. Uh, when you last visited us, we didn't have it installed, but we have at our front door at home installed the code wheel of Monkey Island 2. So just that no pirate can enter. <laughs> really? Didn't yes. know that. Okay. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, I made a blog post about the anthology they released last December. Uh, limited run games and uh, well and uh, to my surprise they also included this coding wheel this code wheel for um, the first and second part of monkey island so that was nice okay (laughs) well um now the other thing is i totally totally forgot it again um yes last year we actually also had an interview with uh, Scott Miller, who is, well, the former founder of Apache Software and also uh, the inventor of Shaver, as we know. And um, next week, they are actually releasing Tour Brew Overkill. Um, so, and I will do a review of it for Scene World because. Um, I got a key, oh. but of course there is there is an embargo, so I can't talk about about details there. But um, I played it today; it was pretty nice. Okay, good yeah. to know. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so that's coming up. Um, well, so thanks already to Stride PR for supplying me the Steam key. I'm looking forward to that. Well, and also other news is that um, Amico in television, so the new console, they released a new price update. They yes. made a new price for um, a one controller version for people that are fine, um, that are fine to, well, use a smartphone, a second controller. Which I kind of find funny because, well, it is it is a family console. At least they sell it like that. Yes. So I, I was a bit surprised they they actually did that. Um, perhaps give me a second and I just pull up the um, press release there. Uh, yeah. But I can already say the thing is, right now they are looking for angel investors you know, mm-hmm. to get the console produced. And uh, so that means the price point for people buying it now is actually twice what the, what the original promised. Okay. So, hmm, I'm not sure. I'm not sure if that is really something they will be successful with, seeing that the price difference is now just a $10. $10 between their console and the Switch, Nintendo Switch, which I already consider a family console, even if not into the extent that um, Hans Ippisch and Tommy Tellerico um, and and all the others from uh, television anticipate. So I just got it here and they write that um, the one controller version costs now 200 um, $69.99 and the two controller versions cost 
$339.99 oh. for the Galaxy Purple edition and also for the vintage wood grain. That means you can no longer uh, pre-order the black and white version. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So that, that was halted. And also, it, we should mention that um, their official supplier in the US was GameStop. And mm. they actually made calls to their pre-order customers saying in the voicemails, literally, that the console is not, is not coming out anymore. Hence, they are refunding all pre-order customers who yes. paid for the console. So I'm not sure what to take out of that, but well, I mean, I, I know Tommy, um, who is not CEO, but CCO um, anymore. I wish him the best. And yes. I also know Hans Ippisch personally in person because we met him a couple of years um, at Games, GameStop, uh, GameStop. Gamescom yeah. and, and yeah. also uh, Tommy Tenerico and Hans were in our um, Gamescom retro panels in the last two years. Um, but it doesn't look good right now, but mm -hmm. we'll see. I really yeah. wish that they would be successful. Yeah. For everybody involved in this project, yes, sure. Yeah. So we will <laughs> see. We will see what, what happens here. At least they are still alive, it seems, to make press releases. Though the company is still there. Um. Hey, we also got last minute news from China that from the May 10th to the 12th, 2022, there will be the 2022 Asia VR and AR Fern Summit and the Asia Digital Display and Showcase Expo. DDSE and um, for those two fairs they will be in the Chinese import and export fair complex in Guangzhou, China. And well, um, that would be all from my side, honestly. So mm -hmm. I would say let's uh, jump with Mate. HA to Triforce Johnson and talk about Jamaica and gaming and his his history with it and well I have to welcome you for the next podcast episode hopefully or one of the future ones because you are leaving us now after this new section has entered. Yes, we will see. I'll try my best. <laughs> <laughs> Alrighty, so chaza, nice, good, good. Today we are talking to Triforce Johnson. And you are called the spokesperson of the Jamaican eSport in general. Yes, to, because I don't want to offend his politics and everything. Because yeah. I don't want to offend any type of political entities. There is another eSports entity in Jamaica called the JEI, the Jamaica eSports um, Initiative. The people that work there, I used to work with. Uh, but they're... Their direction for esports and gaming in Jamaica is more uh, internationally. I'm trying to put the proper words together. They work to get help from outside to help build up Jamaica inside. I gather the resources inside Jamaica to build up Jamaica's esports. So one has a more international influence, the other has a more national in terms of building up. I, I, I tell people, I don't want outside entities to have too much influence inside because then it's no longer Jamaican. It's mm -hmm. then foreign in, um, interest, foreign influence. So those are the two entities. And when I got here, there was no industry or infrastructure for esports. It was really just a, a community of people in Jamaica that was trying to get esports started. And I was recommended by a, a gentleman, his name is called Rion Jefferson. They call him Give Me The Win on Twitch. And he's the one who introduced me to these guys and said, help them build up esports because I lived in America at the time and I was doing a lot of things for um, esports in America with my, my team, Empire Acadia. And I was like, okay, so he's like, why don't you come back home and come help build up um, 
Esports in Jamaica. So I said, okay, that introduced to those guys, and we did some stuff with the telecommunication companies here in Jamaica, Digicel, and a company called Flow, which was at the time called Line. And the entire idea was, before you can start anything, you need to get your uh, infrastructure for communications down pat. If you don't have an internet, <laughs> can't communicate with each other, then you're not going anywhere with esports. You'll move as fast as the days of the arcades. But, so, I just wanted to put that out there. So you have this JEI, and then you have what I do. Of course, no problem. Uh, anyway, you mentioned it. You said returning. So originally, I've read you grow you grew up in uh, New York, actually. Oh uh, yeah, I was raised in New York. So this is me coming back to me. Right. So let's start here. How did it all begin with arcades, computer, whatsoever? What was the starting point for you? Starting point for me was toys. My brother Nathaniel, he's the one who's like, the father would go out and he would go drive to work. And we were home and I like to play toys all the time. And he, he didn't want to be stuck in the house because he didn't want to be stuck in the house. He took me and my little brother, Aaron, to the arcade with him to justify him going out. But we were so young, because like I was like about four and Aaron was three, but he was like five. So he, he would try to go across the street to the arcades and, um, and go play video games. My father didn't like him doing that because it's like my father, single father, mother split up. So he has like some, not even toddlers, less than toddlers, out in the streets of New York City in the Bronx of all places. <laughs> Going to arcades and whatnot. When my father found out, he the guy that worked in the arcade, they call him Bunny. He he knew. He was, Aren't you guys Tony's children? What are you guys doing here? So when my father found out about that, he spoke to Bunny and told Bunny, can he leave his kids there in the arcades while he go work? And he would babysit us. So I, and that was usually like on the weekends and stuff like that. But like Monday through Friday, we go to kindergarten, come back, and he drop us off there. So. That kind of worked out and that's how i really got into like console get no arcade games because that's what started off for me i'm not a car console guy i got into consoles it was reverse engineer i did arcades and my father was like you guys are going out in the street too much and then at, I, we met a couple of friends there and they had like coleco vision they had a vetrix they had a master system then we went backwards to that then my father's like, i don't like you guys going to your friend's house so he brought us an NES. So once he brought us an NES, that was it. It was Dragon Warrior time, Back Xanadu, Metroid, Zelda. So that you wouldn't see us leave because we're home playing. So. <laughs> that, that makes sense. Especially Zelda can really make you sink in yeah. the story and stuff. And where did where did that jump go to esports? There probably must be something in between. The jump, the esports jump actually started before the console. The esports stuff just started in the arcades. Because when we were in the arcades, at my age, I couldn't really comprehend everything. Um, to give you an example, my first interaction with an actual arcade was before my brother took me there. We were on our way home from um, school. My father came picking me up and bringing me back to the house for school. And he stopped in a grocery store. It was like, they sell like uh, vegetables and stuff like that in there. But it's like, like a farmer's market, but it was a farmer's store. And in there had a Star Wars machine. So I wanted to get home in time to go watch cartoons and I kept bothering my father. Come on. And he's, hold on, I'm talking. And he gave me four quarters. He said, go and play the game over there until I'm ready. And I was like, I don't want to play video games. I want to go home. I watch cartoons and that's this is big Star Wars box that I don't really want to play. I'll give you an example. So I I was too short because I was four. I went and I got a crate. <laughs> I put on a I stood on top of the crate just so I can reach the controls and I was playing. And it was simple for me. It was okay. Um, uh, up is down is up and I'm going through these things and I'm just gotta keep mashing the buttons and make sure the lasers are hitting the enemies. So I was like, right, let me, let's do that. And I was doing that and I made it all the way to stage three and a guy came behind me and he was like, how old are you? And I'm like, I'm four. <laughs> 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 I 
play, you, you, you play this game, you're real good at it. And I will always, I'll never forget that story because that's what made me go, I'm good at it. When you get praised at something, I was like, oh, I'm good at it. So I was like, okay, so competitive aspect to it. So when my brother then took us to the arcades for bunnies, my main thing was, what's the high school? I got to beat that. That's what I got to beat. That's all that matters. See, console games at home weren't really competitive unless you had your friends over and you were playing Mario Kart or something like that. But in the arcades, the the the, the genesis of starts in the arcades. And that figuratively, literally, I don't know if you know about a gentleman called Walter Day. <laughs> we have interviewed him a couple of times, yes, yes. Yep, yep. I'm in touch with him, yeah. So, uh, wait, have you interviewed him? Oh, yeah, yes. lots of times. Yes. Yeah. Now, this is funny. You're going to laugh because it's a small world, especially with the internet. If you go on Walter Day's Facebook, you go into his family son, you're going to see that he has a grandson, and it's me. <laughs> really? Yeah, I'm dead serious. You go there right now, you look, it says grandson, Triforce Johnson. So... But obviously, that's figuratively, I'm not his blood grandson, but I've worked with Walter for the last almost 20 years now. Yeah. With his rendition of Twin Galaxies, a friend of mine's introduced me to Walter Day. And my entire thing with Walter was his history, because this all relates to what made me get into esports. When I was a kid and I used to play for high scores, my father actually has a collection of Time magazine magazines. And I had my actually... I have it still, it's in the storage because my father's his past. So I have a collection of a lot of his things that he had. But when I was a kid, I saw the 1982 book and that splash page, the two cover splash page, which it had Billy Mitchell and it had Ben Gold and it had Steve guys in it. When I saw those cards, it was like baseball cards to me, but for gamers. So <laughs> they had pictures there and their scores and the game. And I was the like- trading cards, yes. I, I wanna, I wanna that, I, that's me. That's me in the future. I want to be one of those guys. Uh, in, in, in the, I want to be one of those athletes that play the video games and get recognized for their accomplishment because when I was four, I got recognized for that. So I want to be those guys. When I found out that Walter created an infrastructure that would crown champions, you no, know, host events, crown champions, keep the stats and pretty much manage all of the competitions that's when for me i was like that's esports if you look at the um the twin galaxies uh the twin galaxies uh documentary 22 minutes is on youtube i forgot the gentleman's name we'll, we'll put it up there but i have a copy on of it on my youtube page which i just keep there for archiving purposes everything done in esports today was done in the 80s then the difference is today's esports has more resources, better technology, but video game competitions were broadcasted on, on network media. That's incredible, which was on ABC, had a qualifier for it, which was in Walter Day's Twin Galaxies in Atomwa, Iowa. You had to go through that special competition to crown the three champions that would then go on. That's incredible, which was shown worldwide to find out who their the first video game world champion was, which is Ben Gold. So I'm like, esports existed long before that. Esports has now evolved into this huge global mainstream, multi hundred million dollars, almost a billion dollar industry. So I'm like, the origins of esports go way back in the arcades and the arcades is what started it for me. And that's what made me gravitate to it. So that later on when I get, got older, I was like, Man, I want to make my own esports team. And that's how Empire Arcadia was born. So Empire Arcadia was born through the influence of Walter Day, Walter Day's Twin Galaxies. And I say this because Twin Galaxies is a new owner. So I want to make sure that I separate the administrations. There's Jace Hall's administration from 2014. And then there's Walter Day's from 2013 going back to the beginning. So we are very they, aware of that. Let's be honest. Let's be honest. When when this this cheating stuff started and so on, nobody from Twin Galaxies, from the old Twin Galaxies, wanted to talk to us for a year until things cooled down, and then we would interview all those people like Richie Knuckles <clears throat> and so on. So we interviewed everybody basically, except Chase Hall, 
doesn't do interviews. Yeah. yeah. And there's a reason why he doesn't do interviews. Because um, Charles is a scumbag. Um, <laughs> but what he did. That's just what it is. Every That's the thing. Nobody likes him. Yeah. Everybody yeah. we talk to, nobody likes him. That's the mm -hmm. thing. The reason why nobody likes him in, in, in this scene and uh, in, in this, and, and, and I don't think, I, I don't want to judge all as a person. When I say he's a scumbag, I'll be very particular. What he did was a scumbag thing. Because I, I like to believe that all, every human should be given the opportunity to be redeemed. He, what he did was scumbagish. And I don't want to take too long to even talk about this. How he approached Billy Mitchell and Todd Rogers was a very malicious and millennial way. Hey, we got some dirt on these guys. Let's blow it up and let's do what we can to make this such a huge debacle. It would bring views to our site. And I'm like, at the cost of what? You'd be hurting the scene. Number two, you don't even know the complete situation regarding the two players, whether they cheated or not. Oh, we're not calling them cheaters. Then why are you doing this? So like, oh, so you're just doing this for Facebook views. You're doing this for clicks on your website so you can show investors look how much people come to your website about retro games so you can get their investment but you're hurting the scene. The very same people who come on and use your scene, you're hurting, you're hurting your relationship with Guinness World Records that Walter Day paired you guys together with. You're creating this unnecessary drama for likes mm -hmm. and he damaged the scene. That's why, so like nobody, because of that, nobody wants to deal with it. There's so much things that like the scene has done for him. Oh um, uh, wait to when the well, they lost their, their anti-slap, so they're completely done. So when we get into, when we go into court, it's a wrap for him. There's no way out for him because what he did was like, nobody, nobody's going to forgive him for it because even after they deal with him and he loses and he's going to lose, you can't repair the damage of what he's done. Let me reply to this. The thing is, my my first encounter with Jace Hall was quite good because he helped me getting in touch with Walter Day. So from that standpoint, I'm thankful to him. The way he works is this. When you, if anybody within his administration is to speak, you have to be pro Jace, anti Billy, anti Rock, anti um, Todd Rocks. They even tried coming after me for one of my scores, a Contra score to try to make a debacle. There's an entire hit list. It's a list and literally they posted, one of these kids posted the list online and were like, there's like, we got Billy, we got Todd, now Triforce is next. And I'm like, so I told him, bring it. I was like, the difference between me, um, Billy, and Todd is I'm just one generation behind him. I'm still doing this even in the modern games. So wow. okay. my debacle with them is they said my score for Contra 3 is fake. I maxed up the score. They said I sat there and I leached on enemies. And I said, like, no, I didn't. I was like, the, the, as like this entire discussion happened before Jace Hall's administration, we all know where you can get the score from. The eyes have it. That's the hint. Me and some other guy a long time ago all knew that the last boss, there's a thing you can shoot, and it's, he starts popping out these eyes, and they give you the most points in the game. If you do it, if you do it properly, every time you shoot one of the eyes and it, it, it um, launches out the eye, the boss loses like one pixel of health. So health goes down slowly. This is called forward progress. If his health wasn't going down, then it's called leeching. So I knew this, and a couple of other Contra experts knew this, but they just did not want me to have the score. So there's no trap was cheated to get the score. So I was like, I, this is not to diss Billy, this is not to diss Todd. I don't need to get my practice in, because those guys are like in their 50s and they have families. I'm in my 40s and I have a family, but I don't have kids or anything like that. So I still play video games. I have the time to go back and do this. It's not a problem for me. So I went back, redid it, sent the score to Jace Hall in a picture. And I said, this video is on YouTube. I don't know if you'll be able to see it, but this file right here that I'm pointing at, that's the country three, three hour 
33 minute file of the game. And every year I push it back one more year as it's scheduled to, to launch. So it's supposed to launch December 31st, 2023. And I leave it there on purpose because I told Jace, when you came in and took over the administration from Walter Day, you have to understand that there are people in the scene that are spoiled. They don't like certain people having certain world records. They don't like certain people giving certain acknowledgements. And they're normally just going to say, I think the person cheated. And this is not a kangaroo court. You can't just say, I think the person cheated and automatically they're on trial. It is incumbent, it is on them that if they think that the person cheated, they must bring up the evidence. The score must stand. They must bring up the evidence and they must go through a trial to show that without, I don't have a doubt that this person cheated. There must be no circumstantial counter evidence that says maybe the person did it. <clears throat> it has to be 100% ironclad. We caught this person cheating. This person changed. This person did that. We caught them doing it. If you can't, it's all circumstantial evidence. We are not talking about digital technology. We are talking about analog technology. We do not know what could have been what. This is not like 2015 where everyone had better streaming equipment like Elgato's and Avery Media's. People were using Dazzler. Dazzler. You don't know what works. What cut plugs in RG blue cord. Stop. So I'm like, you're making a huge mistake here. You just don't know. You are not a certified board engineer. You don't know. And you'd have to do so many different tests just to find out. The best way to make this happen is you put an asterisk next to their score and you say to the person, listen, unless you can get evidence from the game creators or you can redo the score again, we're going to have to put an asterisk here because you are suspected of cheating. We can't conclusively prove that you cheated unless someone comes out. I had this tape and I've been saving it a long time. He cheated and it shows. Then it is. Let's go. That's the evidence. But un unless you have that, you cannot go rewriting the database. You will open up Pandora's box and all types of worms will come out. You will end up destroying your own scene that you're supposedly trying to clean up. He didn't want to listen. So they tried it on me. I sent in the score. They said, send us the videos. I'm not sending you anything. I'm like, my score was verified by Walter came in and said, I verified the score for Triforce. I signed off for it. They said they wouldn't take Walter's word for it. Ah. I didn't want to get you into rage here. <laughs> no, I'm not. No, I'm, that's, I'm, a, I'm a very eccentric person, so sometimes I, it'll look like I'm upset about something, but that's me passionately talking. Okay. Uh, but, yeah, you mentioned certified board technician. We actually uh, spoke to Wishy Knuckles. He would not comment on the Donkey Kong thing at all. And he, he is a technician, so he wouldn't comment on it. So I don't know what his opinion about this, but he wouldn't talk about this when we interviewed him for the podcast. So it's a layer It's a layer of dust and nobody wants to reveal it. So And the, and the more that we talk to people about this, the more that Roy Schultz stuff seems valid. And it's... Yeah. Well, oh, well, the thing here is, so uh, my part in that entire scenario, in the legal case, a lot of testimony that I've given in, I never wanted Todd Rogers to redo the score all over again. And the reason why I told Todd Rogers you can't redo the score all over again is because the Ataris that you're dealing with now, the controllers that you're dealing with now, the technology that you're dealing with now is all different. They're mm. literally 30 years apart. You did not play on the same, what's the word for this thing here? You did not play on the same graded CRT from 1980. You're playing on CRTs that does not have any errors. The mm -hmm. CRTs today are way better than the CRTs yesterday. Another thing people don't um, know, the GPUs and the original Ataris, the first mock Ataris along with the games were messed up. There's an Atari 2600A and an Atari 2600B. Nobody talks about these things. Mm. Process can be off by a little bit, and a little bit is all you need to be off by one tenth mm. of a second. That's all you need. 
-hmm. and I'm like, the heating between the coils and the springs used in these analog-based technologies, you don't get that in an emulator. Mm. So I told him, it is set against you. It is going to be, you are going to need another one in a million to be able to do it. So I said, do not go down their direction. I said, let us find out, because the argument was, is, it is technically impossible to get a 5.51. So I said, Adam, let us go break the game. If you break into the coding of the game, you'll see what the fastest you can get. So I explained to him, breaking into the game, code, and breaking down all of the things that would be obstacles to get into the, the way of the score is the only way for you to find out what the true timing of it, it is. Why is this necessary? Why is this direction necessary? Because this direction will show human incident happened for them to get that score. Because he was only able to get it done three times in his lifetime. And they were all done in the same year. Mm. So it's not like he got it again in 1989 and then he got it again in 1990 on the better technology. So like, we can't grab, we can't get that old technology again. No, there are no Atari 2600s, A's or B's anymore. There are flashbacks, which are like <laughs> the Atari 2600 perfect. So like whatever errors that were made in any of those, the ones we have them on the flashback, they're perfect. They're, those problems don't exist. They're using better transistors, better coils, better all of this. So I'm like, you're never going to get that. And then you have emulators, which is all a digital rendition of the perfect Atari. So you'll never get any errors. Clearly, to get that score, you have to have an anomaly error. You're looking for a glitch. That is what you're looking for, a glitch. And you're mm. not going to get that glitch. And that's what they're going to say. It, oh, you cheated. No, clearly that was a glitch. Come on, we all know that to get that 5.51. I'm like, anyone would know that. But no, they didn't want to accept that. So I said, we have to prove that this glitch is possible. Once you prove that the glitch is possible, the score should stand. So we went, debugged the game. We took out the gear shift and stuff so that Todd Rogers could be able to glitch into second gear out of the gate. Yo, they were able to get three point something. Three. There's a there was a four point four um four point five four. It was infinitely faster than Todd Rogers. And I was like, mm -hmm. so once we did that, I posted this up on YouTube. And I was like, look. You can just break through the game and brute force the game and get the scores. So they move the goalposts. We're not talking about it's impossible to get that score. We're just saying that Todd Rogers did it by whatever and we need him to redo it again. I'm like, that's like asking the Jordan at his age right now, go back and score 50 points in a basketball game. Come on. Like, this is stupid. We're being stupid here. They all ignore that, which all of that is used in the case. Then, after they got Todd Rogers, this is the exact point I was trying to make. So, Kotaku made an article. You can look it up. I know. Yeah. Oh, I know this article. Yeah. And after 20 something years, someone found the glitch in Barnstorm that beat the record Todd Rogers had in Barnstorming by a whole one. It went from 30 something to 20 something. Like, and it's like that one glitch no one knew about. Like, this is what I, I would hate. 10 years down the line, someone found the glitch and reproduced the 5.51, but you destroyed Todd Rogers. You destroyed Todd Rogers. It's too late. Even if you exonerate him, it's too late. And I told Todd, let me talk to Jace about this. Todd said he wanted to do it on his own. Jace, mm -hmm. and if I say certain things because this is all evidence that's going in the case, which is going to, this is going to clap Jace Hall. There's a conversation with Jace that he had that Jace should not. And you can't go back to the words because we have all of that literally videoed and screen captured. So they go, oh, that's Photoshop. Okay, here's a video version of it. So, yeah. And uh, he did something actually illegal, completely mm -hmm. illegal. They set him up on the Ben Heck show. They, they gave him three days to repeat something that took two years for him to do when he was 16. He had to do it mm -hmm. in, at 50. And they couldn't redo something at age 50, which took him two years to do at age 16 on a newer equipment at age 50, he cheated. I'm like, this is... Yeah, that makes sense. Actually, I don't want to refer too much to myself, 
But actually, I had a part in that because you mentioned as long as the coder of the game says it isn't possible, it should be considered possible. And here's the thing, back then when this Todd Rogers thing came up, I was, I'm still friends with that person that was head editor of the news blog part of Twin Galaxies, mm -hmm. of the portal. And this guy, he was, he was wanting on uh, Facebook, anybody who has connections to Activision or knows the coder of the game. And I'm like, yeah, I, I, I'm in touch with David Crane. I know him. <laughs> So actually I got him and David Crane to talk to each other and he was interviewed and they made, made a big article on Twin Galaxies where he said that he thinks the score from Todd Rogers is perfectly possible by the game code. And that's, and I know what audio you're talking about. We went to the International Video Game Hall of Fame a year after and I interviewed Billy Mitchell with David Crane. And I put the interview up and David Crane is, look, there are so many things that were wrong with the Atari 2600 and its games. There are, they, he gave us a story about a game that they thought they had fine and they wanted to display it and some kid played the game. I'm just paraphrasing here. And the kid broke the game. David Crane told the guy, I, let me go back before we put this on the show floor. Let me go back and make an adjustment. Said, no, we can't do that. We got to go to the show floor. And they went to the show floor with this game that's not complete. And David was like, a lot of these things happened back then. So I'm like, the fact that the creator of the game is saying that should be enough to say, listen, we do not have any conclusive evidence that Todd Rogers is a cheater. There are too many variables. We were not there. All we can do is take a witness statement. In the US, the law is if you get testimony for witnesses, then that's, that serves better evidence than physical evidence. Well, the creator of the game told you it's possible. Why are we having this discussion? So he wants to argue now with the creator. You're arguing with the guy that built the game. Do you even make video games? No, shut up. So you, now you know who got them together. It was me. <laughs> it was me. <laughs> and this is so stupid. But like, so then when, when they did what they did to Todd Rogers, there's a list of people that they're going after. And they're going after everyone Walter Day helped, quote unquote, prop up these old school gaming legacy. They wanted to make it look like Twin Galaxies was this corrupt organization run by this old man, Walter Day, who propped up these champions and none of these guys are real champions. And Jace Hall came to save the day by cleaning up the old Twin Galaxies and making a new Twin Galaxies with brand new are true champions so that they can say that the old Twin Galaxies was a corrupt organization, so the beginning of esports didn't start there. It started in the modern age. Because if you can prove the first institution or an infrastructure for esports was a corrupt organization, they nullify it. So you'll have to then go forward in time to find the next one. And then that will wipe out Walter Day as the father of esports. It'll wipe out Billy Mitchell as an esports legend. It'll wipe out the King of Kong. So I'm like, they're trying to rewrite history. Mm, Todd, Rogers was, Todd Rogers was known as the oldest, the oldest video game world record held. He had the longest standing video game world record held. I'm the one who provided the information to Guinness World Record that his record was the oldest. This is the part Guinness World Record didn't even know about. Guinness World Record gave Todd Rogers the dragster record, not Twin Galaxies. It was Guinness that gave it to them. So then in 2012, I sent them in that information and Guinness then made a brand new world record for Todd Rogers called the longest standing world record in Guinness history for video games. So Todd Rogers had all of that. So it was a hit to get rid of guys like me, Todd, Ben, Steve, all of the guys from the King of Kong movie, all of the guys from the Chase and Ghost movie, that's what they want to, because they want to build a new era. They're like literal digital colonizers. They came in to wipe out the old history of Africa and rewrite a new one, draw new maps and borders to the country and prop up their new champions. And I'm like, everyone can see you doing this, Chase. Like, you're... You're not even covert about it. You're so sloppy and stupid about it. And I speak frankly because I don't give a fuck about Jace Hall. I actually don't. <laughs> so you want to, to have this all part of the actual interview no, afterwards? Keep, keep all of, you keep all of this in. 
and it okay. comes out of my Just I ask want, him. I want him to know. The thing is, I like Jason. That's the funny part. When he was doing his elite studios, I was one of those people in his elite studios during his streaming. Late at night with him, three o'clock in the morning, watching him code. And I'm like, this I like this guy, man. This guy wants to really do good for gaming. But what I don't like about him, he allowed the trolls. The jealous mm -hmm. little trolls who want to get Billy Spain and who want to get Walter Spain. He allowed them to poison him, to attack his own people and create his fault. And this is what I don't like about him, what he allowed them to do. As a person, I don't know him well enough to say he, as a person, is a piece of garbage. And so I won't do that. I know how to compartmentalize my personal opinion and to my professional opinion of him is that he's an idiot. Like he had a great opportunity okay. to twin galaxies into the stratosphere and he just destroyed it. He just quit. He wanted to appease these polls, these trolls who wanted to have a voice in gaming and it's look what you cause. Now you're in a lawsuit, right? This is not gonna end well for you. It, the, the best thing for him to do is settle. I don't know what he's gonna do, but I personally hope he doesn't settle because for the sake of the scene, he needs to be found guilty. Hmm. Because him settling doesn't solve anything. The trolls will simply right. say, oh, due to legal loopholes, Billy Mitchell bought off the judge, just like I said when Guinness reversed their this, uh, their uh, uh, their decree on uh, it's not decree, but when they reversed the decision on Billy and gave Billy back his world records, the troll said Billy paid off Guinness, hundred million dollar Guinness world records. Billy Mitchell paid them off to get his records reversed. You see how stupid this is. So if they don't go to court and find Jace guilty, they'll just move the goalposts and say something else. That means Billy Mitchell sold a lot of hot sauce for that. Millions of bottles. Anyway, of course, the, the difficult thing for us is, as a journalistic point of view, to stay neutral in a way. As I said, despite all this liking for Chase Hall, and he, he still helped me to get in touch with all you guys to get to Walter Day. And so you, we could say your relation with Chase Hall is a love-hate relationship. My relationship huh? with all is purely professional. Like I said, I I yeah. met. We did this excavation of a building in which he was looking at for some potential future uh, prospects for his business. We walked and we talked. And as a human being, he's a decent person. So I, I met the person face to face, and I've talked with him. He's a cool guy. Whatever. He and Billy helped lift Walter up on their shoulders when Walter was passing the torch over to Twin Galaxies. There's a Guinness World Record plaque that I, I contacted Guinness to get Guinness to recognize Twin Galaxies as the first and the oldest esports organization in the world. There's a reason why that to happen. It's because when did esports start? There's a difference between competitive gaming and esports. Um, it started when video games was invented because gaming is competitive. So whether you're saying 1948 or nine, knots and crosses, or you're talking about the CRT to the video game that they made in 1951 or 52. Doesn't make a difference which one of those are considered the first video games. Whichever one is validated as the first video game, once you played it, it was competitive. Competitive gaming started then. Competitive gaming ran from, let's just say, 1949. 1949 all the way to 1980. Every competition that was there for the sake of just the competition. People will say, what about the space and happened the consumer electronics show yeah those guys were trying to sell their video game they're trying to port their video game from arcade to home so they said let's host a gaming tournament and then so we can use that as a marketing tool to promote the video game they didn't care about did, did they have another competition the year after did they create an infrastructure and say hey listen what was it title well title made the arcade game was it activision saying hey we're gonna have an activision esports on gaming league on Space Wars or whatever the game was, um, Space Invaders. No, they didn't. They just held that competition at E3 and then that was it. E3 has been doing that for gaming for years. They still do it to this day. I'm like, is that an esports competition? No, that's a promotional aspect of, your, of what you're doing at E3. So people would use that or they would use the Stanford University, the Space Wars competition. And I'm like, first of all, that was a private competition on their school. So are you saying 
that if I hosted a video game tournament in my garage back in 1974, that's esports? No, that's just me hosting a competition in my garage. I'm like, <laughs> guys, come on, stop. In order for it to be esports, you have to create an infrastructure that's going to host the events, maintain the stacks, crown the champions, celebrate your victor, um, your victors and your champions like they're athletes. That's why it's called e-sports. It's in likeness to sports. So you have to do it like sports. Like, you can't... The National Basketball Association doesn't go to E3 and open up a basketball ring and hosts an all-star game and counts it as sports. No, it would be considered like some type of celebrity act. But, like, you want to do the actual basketball? Then you go and you compete in the NBA. I, I use this analogy all the time. Mm. When did basketball become a sport? So they go, so I said, stop right there. When was basketball invented? 1889, James Naismith. So the game, watch this, the game of basketball was invented in 1889. When did it turn into a sport? When the CBA and the NBA came. There you go. When was competitive gaming invented? 1949. When did it turn into a sport? Twin galaxies. Mm. But we got a bit sidetracked here. Originally, we wanted to talk about what's going on in Jamaica. And now we got this, it all a bit back, twisted. This circles back to the question what got me into esports. So, <laughs> when Twin Galaxy created the infrastructure for esports, and I saw that, that's when I, I want to become a competitive gamer. I want to become an electronic gamer. So, I've been, at that time, I followed gaming, and I just I wanted to go and become as good as I can at any game I can from the arcades to the consoles, because I didn't know where the competition were at in the 90s. Then I crossed guys like Fatal. Uh, Fatal was like, that, we, that was the man. Like, Fatality was that dude. You had Thresh uh, before him with Doom and whatnot. And, but Fatality was the man, because Fatality was the guy that when he went out and he started competing at these video games tournaments, he kept calling it electronic sports. From my knowledge, I'm sure there's a lot of people that call it electronic sports, but he was the man at the top at that time calling electronic sports. And when I spoke to Fatality back in, what was it, 2007 or 2009? I think it's which you have spoke to him directly. No, 2006. I think it was at a game, Digital Life. I spoke to him. I'm not sure. I spoke to him a couple of times because I spoke to him at MTV one time. I spoke to him at Digital Life. I spoke to him at the International Video Game Hall of Fame tournament. Uh, no, not tournament, um, event. So, but one of the times I spoke to him and I kept using the term video game tournaments. And he was like, it's better to say esports. And I said, like, why? And he was like, in his experience growing up, every time you say video game tournaments, you denigrate what I thought. Esports is the professional way to say video game tournaments. Back in his days when he was growing up, and he said when he used to go and try to find sponsors, he would approach sponsors and say, I need sponsorship for a video game tournament. And they were like, they were looking at him, go get a job, kid. So until he started using the term esports is when businesses started taking him seriously. And I was like, oh, yeah, you're right. So from my experience, because of fatality, I think he championed the word esports, which made companies take it seriously to say, okay, listen, I want to go push this. And this is a story a lot of people don't know and they don't talk about. They don't give fatality. To and I'm sure there are other people who have used the word esports. But at the time, fatality was the man at that time. He's the faker of the, the time. He's the, I want to say Daigo now. He was the Sonic Fox gaming now. The, like the top guy that when he went and he said that, he championed that terminology for us that made businesses take Esports seriously, and and then revolutionize the entire esports industry because there was an industry before it. It was just not as prominent as it is now, and it moved forward from there. So, I then made my team back in 1999. I started putting together the the pieces of my team, and in 2002, I literally filed for Empire Arcadia to be my official esports team. And then we started getting all of these champions in. And we didn't want our team to just be like, we play this one set of games. We want it to be an empire. So in order for it to be an empire, we wanted to literally 
play against no play against the best in everything. So we played retro games. We played first person shooters, racers, puzzles, everything down to trading card games. We wanted to be. We had a guy called Aaron Kaiba. Um, we call him Kaiba for like Yu-Gi-Oh, but his name is Aaron Diaz. We had a bunch of other guys. Oh my goodness, I can't remember Chris's last name. We got Justin Wong. We had Michael Mendoza, Sanford Kelly, um, Jason Zimmerman, Mewtwo King, Armada. We started getting all these champions that came in on our team in the what's it in Gears of War. We had a guy called Fatal Strike, and he's actually one of the greatest players and coach in in, in all of these sports. There's a lot. Tara, Ricky Mart uh, Richie Martinez. He was he was one of the head coaches because we had two different. Uh, Years of War teams, and he he led one of our in, um, League of War teams. At that time, they called themselves Team Legacy, and then they turned them their name to Team Infinity. So we've had a hat. We've been in World Cyber Games. We've been in MLG. We've been in Evolution. We've been all over the place. We traveled to Australia, Japan, China, the UK, Africa, now the US, the Caribbean. We're all over the world in terms of what we do as an esports team. Due to the coronavirus. Last two years has been esports tournament we hosted in 2021 was the Just Dance Off 2022 competition sponsored by the Long Island Gaming League. But our Valkyries hosted the tournament and did the competition. My wife is a 2015 Just Dance Off champion for Jamaica, well, for the Inter Caribbean and stuff like that. So she hosted the tournament with the Valkyries and we crowned the winner. She got wet. She won some money. She spent a week with the, a weekend with the Valkyries at an Airbnb retreat and stuff like that with the live video game TV, which is how you guys got um, caught up with them and whatnot. And now she even joined the Valkyries. So we try to mesh ourselves within the, the community and the culture of esports at the same time working to help build the infrastructure of esports because it's more than just the industry. You have to, someone has to go down into the community and get their hands dirty to help. I don't want to say clean up, although it is cleaning up. It is to help make the scene better for everybody. That's just what it is. Okay. No, yeah, you mentioned actually on the other monitor, I actually have this video actually on about this long um, island gaming league, Just Dance of 2022. Yes, and um, as I said, the lab video game TV is actually how I got to introduce to you by a guy called um, Wayne Benjamin. Yes, right, right. Benjamin. That is the he's the um, executive. He's the main guy. He's the CEO for the lab video game TV studio in which he covers gaming. He's the, literally the only video game gaming um, entity in Jamaica. And as a producer now, since he likes video games himself. He creates content on gaming in Jamaica. And I, when I first met him, I told him, I was like, you, for gaming, he's the single most important person in the entire island of Jamaica. This, even over me. He says, no, he's, we both are because where I can bring in the comprehensive content, he's the producer that can put it together that represents us in a positive, professional light. Let me tell you, boy, television, all around the world does not represent gaming in a positive light. They represent us, they marginalize us, and they represent us as a joke. And that's what I really don't like about them. With the exception of G4 then and the returning of G4 now, although G4 is in a lot of trouble now because of this whatever nonsense is going on. <laughs> but he does not represent us like a bunch of kids who did not grow up, men and women, children who are just playing video games. He represents it as the industry it is, the entertainment that it brings, and the money that it makes, and also the culture behind it. So for him, he does reviews and gaming and things of that nature, and he's always looking for new content that can interweave gaming into our social lives as people, because he wants people to recognize that just because we play video games doesn't mean we're not human. Like, we still go to the movies. We still go to the beaches. We still go out with our friends we still spend time with our families we still have jobs like we're not like these creatures that's like in our basement in our mother's house like not paying rent living off our mothers and just playing video games 24 7. although there are guys like that that exist 
But that's the point here. <laughs> the point we're trying to make is that the majority of us are not like that. You guys should really interview him. I'm, I'm surprised that you're interviewing me, but you really <laughs> interview him. Because like, Next oh, Monday. Hey, what I'm talking about. You guys are going to learn so much about him. Which is interesting because when, when, when I approached him, he literally replied to me within 10 seconds. I was like, I just sent out my email. How can he reply so quick? And actually, he started like telling me that you are the big shot and we should yep. talk to you first. And then okay. afterwards, we had the appointment with you. He said, oh, by the way, if you like, you can also interview me and talking about the journalistic side. And now you are telling us that he's the bigger shot. So you are complimenting each other. Okay, so we had the, we had the conversation and I told he, when he told me, there's these guys I want to interview you. Uh, first of all, he's a strict professional. He's such a strict professional, I hate it. He does not like lateness. He, he despises tardiness. He believes that his, I don't want to put his personal uh, business out there. He goes to sleep at six o'clock in the evening. Who does that? He wakes up at 4 a.m. in the morning. Who does this? I'm like, like, with the lights down from the sun, that's when your body should be going to sleep so that you can wake up fully invigorated, uh, ready to do business and work in the morning. He's very undisciplined. And I'm like, oh, my goodness. So I get a lot of shit from him about it. But he's, and he's got to get up in the morning on time because time waits for no one. You're supposed to be working during the sun. Then you're supposed to be sleeping during the moon. So for him... He has, he, has a, he has more phones, and he has a phone on him. So the minute he gets an email, this is him. Checks on <laughs> okay. things that remove all foolishness from his email. You message him, bring. Yes, he's replying to you instantly. Whether he's driving, in the bathroom, on the toilet, he's just, he's a workaholic. And like I said, when I say he's a professional, he is. Although, if you get into candid conversations with him, he's like, oh, you are human. Oh, okay. All right. I, I thought you was just like a robot. But yeah. People... Such people have to be careful to not burn out. At some point, but he's a very hard worker. But when I guess what is this? When it comes to journalism, that's the guy. When it comes to the esports and the infrastructure of the scene, how it got built up, who's involved, the key players, and what is the roadmap and the strategy, I'm the guy for that. So we both come to each other. Nice. Another thing that, that was interesting when we emailed with each other, I told you that pre prior to you, we also made interviews with people in Russia and also in, in Venezuela. And when I told you that the particular, the one in Venezuela was pretty sad because video games are illegal there, you told me like, yes, I know. It's part of my job to know what's going on in other parts of Latin America and stuff. So you are pretty much in the picture, and I thought I'd tell you something new, but obviously I didn't. Yeah, a lot of things is a lot of things is new. Here's an example. You may not know this. Did video games, did esports get into the Olympics? In the Olympics? No. Yeah. Yes, in 2016, the video games were part of the Rio Olympics in Brazil. Really? Okay, yeah. didn't know that. Okay. Right. Fly last minute to get my team to go down there, but I missed the window. But it was a part of the Olympics, as in the at the Olympics, it's called the E Games. Look it up, Brazil. Google E Games Brazil. Rio, yeah, Olympic. The Olympics in Rio, Brazil. E Games. You can't miss it. 2020, uh, 2016. They had a couple of teams come down there and compete in the Olympics. It was associated to the Olympics to have it at the same time. Whether or not it was Olympic approved. The point is it happened there. And this is the point I'm trying to make. That was never news. And the reason why it's never news is because it didn't happen in America. It didn't happen in the first world country. No one's going to, they're going to tuck that under the rug. We're going to put that under the rug. Until we get it in any first world country like China, Russia, Japan, US, UK. When we do that, then we're like the first Olympics, blah, blah, blah. But then what happened to the E-Games in 2016 uh, in, in Brazil for the Olympics? Nobody knows about those things. So it's my job to, I travel the world. I, I, me and Wayne went to for a live video game TV for uh, a, the sponsor, Color Switch, the actual phone game. Um, oh, yeah, we that, talked to him too. You know about Color Switch, right? Oh, yeah. So we, um, Color Switch sponsored us to go there to host a Color Switch 
esports trio event in Ghana. It, it was a mobile game, a console game, and, and, and a PC game. The PC game got switched to just another console game because we wanted it to be FIFA. Just keep it on console. It makes everything easy. So it was FIFA, Just Dance, and then Color Switch. And we went there. We spent an entire month in Africa to lead up to promote this big event, which was held in a television station, Kwesi TV. And it was broadcast nationally and then also throughout the entire continent of Africa because Kwesi TV was connected throughout all of um, um, Africa. And it, I have a copy of that I can show you guys that's on our YouTube channel. So we do things like that. We go to other countries around the world to, 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 to pretty much shed light on what's going on in esports in those areas. So just like I'm down here doing this for Jamaica, I was also in St. Martin before Jamaica, back in 2012, 2013, promoting BXG. The guy that promoted BXG, the esports tournament organizer that promoted BXG video game tournament is now the prime minister of St. Martin. He's a prime minister. And it's crazy, isn't it? How did this guy go from tournament organizer to prime minister of the country? And then last month, I in the month of February, because relatively it's February still, but in the month of February, he got parliament for his country to re legitimately recognize esports as a sport in the Caribbean. So his country is the first country for the government and parliament to recognize esports as an elite. Uh, and I'll send you the newspaper clip on that as well. Here's the thing, but we have noticed is that it's really hard sometimes to find people from how do you say border case countries to talk to you in English about what's going on with video games? I remember we made two interviews with with the founder and chairman of Tech Toy, and mm -hmm. getting in touch with him took me seven years because people were were trying to talk Portuguese with me, or they would tell me write this, write an email, or call this number, and we will get back to you. And never got an answer. So it's really hard to convince people to actually take those interviews. And uh, because they are afraid sometimes to talk in English or they mm -hmm. say they are not important enough or it's too long time ago, they don't remember very much. So it's not so easy. For example, when we spoke about Russia, we, we had to bring in a translator and in the end, the translator didn't do any work because <laughs> they found it was easier to talk in English directly than going over a translator. So that is our issue uh, from the journalistic side to find people that are willing to talk about how things started in their country. And like with you, it's it was just a pure luck that I found a post of uh, this this cosplay event that happened on Facebook. Yeah, yeah. That that that, that, that you, you see my wife in it. She she did her thing. She she does most of the stuff. I try to focus on women's contribution to esports. This is a this is a, a highly under. I don't want to say underrated. It's just not. It's just not covered. Gaming cannot reach the limits it needs to reach without women. We need women in it. They bring up. They they add. Uh, they add a side to it that men cannot. We just can't. We're not girls. So like, <laughs> we're not women. So we can bring a certain side to it to gaming that would complete it. So e as big as esports is, it's still incomplete in a lot of areas especially in the cultural aspect of it. And, and I think women can bring a large part of that over. So that's what I, I, fo I focus on the, the girls. As a guy, I don't want to do just dance, right. but women love that. You see what I'm saying? And that's not to say that there are games catered to women. There are just games women fit better in. So guys can, because I know guys who like to dance. I'm just not one of those guys. But uh, women, the way just dance is set up, the way it is, the way it appeals to people, that is something women are more, it would suit women better to push those games. Here's the thing though, here's the thing though, it depends on who you ask. We were, we were the, the entity that were the final ones interviewing Fractals two weeks before, before Ubisoft shut them down. And the reasoning of Ubisoft was 
that women are now seen as commonplace in the competition and video game world. So a, a women only competition uh, group like the Fractals is no longer necessary. That That is, that in my opinion, this is why I don't, and um, this is exactly why I don't like corporate entities. <laughs> because because that is so stupid and, and that, that i know you be, this is gonna come back and bite me ass because like Trevor, you should have made that comment but I, I i need to say this no this is a man's world and i don't mean that in a negative place to say that women have no place in the world it's just that men dominate the world we control everything we need women to be able to express themselves we cannot express women for us and it's, it's so funny we're talking about this because this is what myself and that video game tv are working on currently right now how women express having fun the 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 girl her name is raya she won the just dance competition in december that just passed she went out to the retreat to hang out with the girls the way girls in the wayne did a short piece called the retreat the group is called the balconies of arcadia they're my female division for Empire Arcadia. Empire Arcadia is a parent organization. We, we out, The guys that fight in the competitions are called the Knights of Arcadia, and the women are called the Valkyries. We even have an African translation for them called the Minu of Arcadia, because Mino, M-I-N-O, is African for our mothers. So the, the Valkyries, their job is to represent gaming from a woman's point of view, with no male into, um, influence, none. Our input is zero, it, it's going on at zero. There are no influence, we cannot have any influence. We want them to be women. We don't want them to say, see, we can play guys. No, don't play like guys, play like women. We, we want that. It's, the, it's no difference from female and male sports fans. The way women react in sports is different from the way men react in sports. And it's refreshing to get that feministic energy from a woman because she can be herself. She doesn't have to touch the bell. I got enough of that from my bros already. Like, I don't need to get that from my bros. And I'm getting that from a woman. I'm like, whoa, hold okay. on, hold on. I, I, Getting that over here. Can I get some diff I need a different feedback energy from this side, please. But the girls are doing it because men, we imply to them that's the only way we're going to accept you being a part of enjoying this activity if you act like us. Mm. And to me, that's just like, no, why can't they be themselves? And that goes on in almost every aspect in life. And that's just, that's psychologically not good and socially not good if i could be a little bit if i could be a little bit tactless here anything as you like just to prove the point i'll try to use the proper words because this is an interview and some level of professionality must remain in it <laughs> imagine you having sex with your woman and she's grunting like a man and she goes but i'm like a guy no I need you to be a woman. What? If I wanted you to be groaning like a guy, I'd have sex with a guy. That's the point I'm trying to make. So if I wanted women to be like guys in video games, I would hang out with my guys. So if I'm hanging out with women in gaming, I want them to be like women. And this that's the issue. So we are really focusing on that. And when they went to the retreat, the girls were in in the pool, they were playing just gas, they were diving in the pool. I'm like, guys would do that, but like, the way guys do it is different. The girls get up in the morning, they're, they're eating, they, they make themselves breakfast and they eat and they're talking on a thing. I don't think guys would necessarily would do that. Like a, one of the bros, we let's go to the gym. We go and grab a burger or something like that. And we hit the gym and we're in the gym and we're working out. The girls were doing their exercise on the ring fit. You see what I'm saying? After that, the girls want to on <laughs> and play some video, uh, and just relax and talk, they're chilling in the hot tub. I'm not chilling in a hot tub with dudes. I'm just not doing that. Hey man, beer. I'll go into the couch, <laughs> we'll watch some TV. They wanna play video games, they go on a bed. And they're playing um, one, two switch, and then they play Mario Kart. Oh, they're fun. That's not to say, 
girls do not play hardcore competitive games. Because I know people, why is he mentioning all those games? What about Fortnite or League of Legends or, or Street Fighter or Mortal Kombat or Call of Duty? <laughs> play those two. That, yeah. That's what I'm talking about. I'm talking about on a casual basis of just relaxing to the, the, the average guy does not relax playing Super Mario Party. That's that's true. Yeah, I get your point. We interviewed once Vanessa Ortega, who is who was a professional e player for Dead or Alive. So I totally get your point. And I actually saw the video that you mentioned with with Ring Fit playing and so on. Yeah, I, I saw that video. So I totally understand what you mean. Yeah. So I'll, my job right now, while I'm well, I have a bunch of stuff that I'm doing, but those are one of the things I'm focusing on. Is I, we need in order to get more girls in, which is good for the industry, more sales, more interaction, more engagement. That's what you want. More, more people to advertise to. So this mm -hmm. helps. We have to let girls know it's okay to be just you. Come on in. Play the way you want to play. It's okay. But right we, now, I think right now the women targeting is more Candy Crush. At least that is how it feels for me. Yes and no. Okay, one. The, we, the reason why it appears that way, because it, it's an appearance, it's not reality. It's because Candy Crush, Bejeweled, and games of that nature are on phones. I'm as a guy, when I'm, when, okay, I don't, like re, I don't like phones. I'm not a phone guy. But if I'm on, if I'm in a, a taxi ride with my wife and we're driving to Kingston, and I see her playing one of them phone Candy Crush type games. I'm like, come on, let me get a level. <laughs> I'm, I'm in the car, I'm sitting there. I, I'm seeing you doing. I want to play too. So guys and girls play Candy Crush. Girls are more attached to their phones than men. This is a. They did a. I, I gotta find an article where it, it shows that women keep their phones on them more than men. We guys, especially younger guys, if you go back, we kept our Game Boys, our Game Gears, our Nintendo DS our PSPs on us like we did phones. Now that handheld is pretty much out the door now because everyone has a phone and if anything, you can always just carry a switch. Everybody has a portable machine on them. But at the time when Candy Crush was around and handhelds were still there, women ate up Candy Crush. That's why it appears that way. But girls play all types of games. It's just not Candy Crush. It's just like they have their phone on them. So Candy Crush it is. It's there. Good point. Good point. Yeah. Yeah, but guys do it too. I've seen guys on trains playing Candy Crush and all types of other games. Temple Run, remember those games? So yeah, guys, if you have a phone, these are the games you download on a phone. I play Color Switch and I play Color Switch 2, which is a Temple Run like rail um, game. And I'm on Color Switch 24 seven when I'm on my wife's phone. <laughs> okay. Yeah. <laughs> Dispel that, that it's, it's, oh, girls just play Candy Crush. Nah, Candy Crush, how big it is because of men and women, particularly women. That's because they have their phones on them. Good point. I'm not good at a uh, color switch. You know, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. One yeah. or two. One or yeah, two. Either, either of them. Not good at either of them. Oh. Yes, I remember when we interviewed him about yeah, we color switch. That, you wanted to make you wanted to make a gameplay footage. Yes, yeah. And you're totally faked fa Yeah, it. and it's just me dying over and over again. Yeah. Uh, my wife hit 400 on the game. Whoa. But the special thing about the creator of Color Switch, just to interview here a bit, is that everything he learned came out of books. Yes. Oh, oh so this is all connected. <laughs> Small world. So I know David Rajek. I've been to his house <laughs> with today, Dr. Chris. And when I was there, that, that's how we got sponsored by Color Switch to begin with. This guy is so fundamentally sound when it comes to his game creations. He just has books, book. It, he almost has a library. The guy should make a library of all the different game devs and, de and game that he's literally being inspired by reading and when he makes his games. That's why it, it, Color Switch has 300 million downloads because he has the fundamental core principles of game design imprinted into his game that psychologically affects us, that we don't even know it, that we're just downloading the game because the, the core elements of gameplay is there. Keep in mind, 
there's only two other companies or three other companies in game design that have these core um, elements in their game, which is why they're the number one game sellers of all times. Tetris, Bejewel, Candy Crush, and Color Switch. That's why those brands, they can keep making new iterations of the same thing and they just keep selling. They understand the core fundamentals of replay value. The gameplay is so great. Yes, I know this is the same thing you do, but it's so addictive. I'm going to keep replaying this over and over. Just Pac-Man, just like Pong. All of these games have objective puzzle base. You have to figure these things out with standard controls that anyone can play. There is an advanced level of play to it, a mastery level of play to it, but then there's a simple novice level. You can give your three-year-old child and they will know how to play it, but then you can give a grandmaster like Jonas and he will rock out. And I'm a grandmaster myself, so I don't want to put myself down, but shout outs to Jonas because he passed last year. What was it? 2000? It's 2020 or 2021. I think he passed. I think he passed mm. early last year or late 2020. Rest in power to him. But those guys understand those core mechanics so they can build games that people would just keep consuming and consuming. So shout out to David Rychek and his brother Chris uh, for those games because like I'm waiting for Color Switch 3. <laughs> so so one thing that I learned already from this, actually three things I learned from this interview already. If we want to if we want to cover what's going on in Africa at some point, we have to ask you to yeah. get us in touch with somebody from how, what is it? Is it Ghana, right? Yeah, yeah. you need to interview Kwesi Hayford from the Ghana Esports Association, and you have to in, um, interview Yuba Haba. I don't want to butcher his last name. I'm just going to say Yuba, right? You, you can just to... email when you remember. It's fine. <laughs> I, I got them on Telegram. I still talk to those guys, but those guys definitely are people that you need to, to work with for the, the people that connect me back to the home, homeland is Kwesi Hayford. That's how I got connected back. Um, to the homeland, so he's the one. They actually gave me, they awarded me as a Ghana's esports ambassador. So, see. Yeah, and they, they gave Wayne um, his um, a merit of journalism because he came down and he covered the uh, Playbox Ghana Esports Association, the, the, the Gix Gaming Community, which is GGC. There's a lot that we did in in that time. We went to Africa twice, eight, um, 2018 and 2019. We couldn't go because of 2020 coronavirus. And 2021 was just, everyone just stopped from traveling. We're looking that everything goes back to normal by the summer because then we want to look to plan to go back to Africa and, and continue our coverage of esports in Africa. But there's a lot of things going on in Africa, man. Actually, you mentioned it at, at the beginning. You do try to help and bring more awareness to what's going on in Jamaica from within the country. And you have also been interviewed by MTV France, for example to talk yeah. about that, right? So you have really been out there and talk in Europe and not only Africa. So you are really going out there and talk to them about what's going on in Jamaica, so. Yeah, I have to do that because I'm looking at it and I don't see anyone doing it. So yeah. in, order, in order for the Caribbean to grow, in order for um, Africa to grow, somebody's got to go out and push the um, um, esports. But, Realistically, it's not about me pushing Africa and, and Jamaica in esports. It's, it's about pushing esports, period. Mm -hmm. But I want to push it in all of those areas because America doesn't need the help with it. Um, Europe really doesn't need the help with it. China, damn sure, doesn't need the help with it. Japan, okay, let's be real. Okay, Japan, areas, they don't need help with those things. They already have the already built in infrastructures. But like the Caribbean, South America, actually South America is slightly better off than the Caribbean. Even they don't need help with it to a degree. Like, first of all, they have the e-games in Brazil, so they really don't need it. But we definitely, I, I feel that like it's important for me to go into these areas, get the information from the people, get the contacts from the people, and then make myself available to put that information out there so that opportunities like this happen. I meet guys like you and then you're like, hey, we try for us. Feel free at any time. If you say, I want to go to this region, Triforce, have you been to this region in the world? 
I'll let you know. Yes or no. Oh, you have anybody in that area we could talk to? Sure. Let me hit up with an email. Yo, what's up? Hey, Troy, for a long time, I want you to speak to these guys, man. This guy called York and his friend, they're running on this um, online magazine. Hit them up. They want to interview you so you can give them some insight. That helps the global culture of esports connect. The problem here is there are people who are not about that. They don't want that because they want esports to be centralized on them. And they don't understand that when you centralize it into one entity, you don't make it big. Stop trying to monopolize this. If someone needs to create the antitrust esports federation, for real, <laughs> to keep, keep every, people from monopolizing this. Esports does not belong to any one individual, any one organization. It, it belongs to the world as a whole. And it can do so much for the world. That is why Walter Day is the father of esports. Everything you see today doing, in a sense, I'm trying to mimic what Walter is doing, taking what he started and bringing it to the world. A lot of people didn't know that. Walter went to Italy, contacted Japan back in the 80s to start an international esports Olympics. And they had things going. Then they had the, that's when they had the national, the, the US national uh, video game competition, which was the qualifier to that's incredible. They had their Canada, no, California versus North Carolina competition where they, they had states competing against each other. All of this happened in that small town of Ottumwa, Iowa, which is crazy. The history of esports is literally there. Mm. The plaque that Walter got, I, I contacted Guinness and asked Guinness to give Walter the plaque for the oldest esports organization and, and um, adjudicator in the world, Twin Galaxies. And if it's the oldest, was there any adjudicator? This is one of the arguments I tell about people about why Twin Galaxies is the, the founder of esports. Was there any other adjudication organization? I'm not talking about you having a magazine that will record video game world records, or you build a video game company that makes video games but decides to have promotional video game tournaments because those are secondary. The primary function of the magazine is to create a magazine to review video games primary function of the video game developer is to create video games. Yes, you can do your side things, but that's not the primary function. Twin Galaxies was literally designed, literally, to turn competitive gaming into a sport. Hosting yeah. events, founding champions, storing records, and, and celebrating their champions. It doesn't matter what video games there are. Walter Day, before he even founded the organization, traveled the United States to are over 100 arcades to jot down the scores who does that i know yeah he told me about those stories ah, yes yes that's true he went very much beyond and above uh, above that for us the thing is we are not only trying to cover esports but anything in tech basically yeah. and what, what what i try is to preserve stories history how things happen to be and there are sometimes barriers that are very hard to overcome. For example, when we talked about retro gaming in Venezuela, the electricity had to be there, internet had to work, and all those factors. Or once we did an interview about right to repair in South Africa, and the their email server didn't work, and the phone line was barely working, and, and when we did the interview, the guy barely had lights in his house. Those oh. regions, they really have their own problems on top of this tax thing that makes it very hard to preserve and get interviews done. <laughs> so sometimes you are like, oh my God, how can you live in such, such a part of the world? But this is how it is sometimes. Yeah, that, that's how it is in a lot of areas, unfortunately, because if I could not do it here in my place i was going to go to the live video game tv and i was going to do it there that's what I, I originally set up when i called you last week i thought the interview was last week i'm already there i just shoot we'll do it at his place because he has a better background than i do my background's not too bad as guinness records yeah, it's, good. it's all good it's all good yeah but i really wanted to use his i really wanted to use his uh, uh, place it, it just goes to show you where things where things are now. I think you guys magazine is a, a critical piece of resource for uh, tech and esports for sure because if you guys are going around and you're contacting 
guys like Walter and then guys like Wayne, this is great because South America definitely needs it. Trinidad needs it. Tobago needs it. Um, like I, I need to connect y'all to the Prime Minister of St. Martin. I think that would be a very interesting interview uh, to talk because he's trying to get technology into his country as well. And he has an esports background. I, I used to work for him when he was an esports tournament um, tournament organizer. He paid me to be the promoter. You know, we did a lot of things together. And, and he's looking to bring back esports into his country this summer with a soft launch of an event that he's going to be, I think, summertime. But he'll let me know. But this is something that you guys, I, I'm, I'm glad there are people like you guys that are going out there. Connected. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. I'm not giving up so easily. I'm, I'm keep trying. That's my yeah. thing. You know. Definitely. But I was saying that when they there was something I mentioned earlier. When I submitted to Guinness all the stuff that Walter did to prove that they were the first esports organization, I was surprised that Guinness agreed. Uh, but Guinness says whenever they create their records, they have to be Anally accurate. They have to be. For instance, I'll give you an example. Behind, well, I gotta dip here. Behind me in the middle is uh, my Guinness World Record for my team. So it says, the most documented tournament wins for a gaming team stands at 2,000 and was achieved by Empire Arcadia. Now, <clears throat> it was written that way because a lot of people will claim that they have more wins than anyone else. So see how Guinness said the most documented. They have to write the word documented because they're like, anyone can claim I won more than Empire Acadia. And their friend just says, yeah, we've been winning 200 tournaments a month, not a year for the last 10 years, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> but you have to prove to Guinness. Right now we're up to 2,600 because that was back in 2015. So within 2015 and now we won about 600 more tournaments. And and things have slowed down dramatically. I submitted to Guinness in the first original record, which I sent to them. Is that one it? No, because the first one was 1,111. The, the second one there, that's 1,411. See, cause, so the first one was in 2012. Then the second one, that the one we updated, because we would always update with Guinness, they gave us 23, um, in 2013. Then in 2015, they gave us 2,000. I have not sent in the update since 2015 and we're at 26 i keep a copy and they have a copy to the same google database when they are entered and you have to enter the date the event you have to enter the bracket and sometimes you have to enter the actual youtube coverage of it because each year they revise like what they will accept and what they won't because they want to be very anally accurate because of what fortunately guinness doesn't even cover gaming anymore the gamers edition is finished i wonder why so <laughs> we all know the reason why and this is the stupid stuff that we're talking about i do more damage than they do good but when i submitted the evidence to them they agreed that twin galaxies was the oldest adjudication organization for gaming and uh, being an adjudication organization when you adjudicate you're like a referee so twin galaxies was the first is the oldest and the first esports organization. And the founder of Twin Galaxies is Walter Day. Actually, Walter Day is not only the founder, it's a co-founder, but the other gentleman is not involved in the entire Twin Galaxies. That's why most of it is credited to but Walter is a very fair person. So he always lets people know that it's him and the other gentleman that forgot his name, which is terrible. Oh my goodness. That, that, that they're the co-founders. It's just that Walter was the head guy um, for it, but that they founded Twin Galaxies. And Jace Hall, and what's this guy's name? Billy Mitchell. They all went down to Ottumwa, Iowa in 2015. Guinness set the plaque there and they had an entire event about it where I was there they, because I went and got the award for Walter. They wanted me to present the award to Walter on behalf of Guinness. And Walter did to preserve its history. This is why Walter's the man. Instead of taking the record for himself, he donated the Guinness World Record to City Hall of Ottumwa, Iowa. So that City Hall of Ottumwa, Iowa would preserve the fact that Guinness said, your town is the birthplace of esports. Along with the bronze plaque that they have there at the original Twin Galaxies building. Someone pork barrel spending needs to be spent 
to pay the optical eyewear, say, listen, move here and here's some money. And they need to make that place a museum as a national landmark and park for esports, honestly speaking, because a lot of people don't know that history that, like, everything we see esports comes out of that old town of Ottumwa, Iowa. The first esports, the first uh, Hall of Fame for esports comes out of Ottumwa, Iowa. And I'm not even saying the 2010 International Video Game Hall of Fame. I'm talking about Walter Day's 2009 International Video Game Hall of Fame. There was an International Video Game Hall of Fame that predates the, the, um, the one that's there now, and that was because Walter did it. And from that, they took the template of that and said, let's create an International Video Game Hall of Fame. And then, bam, in 2010, the Big Bang, that's what they call it, the International Video Game Hall of Fame was born. So it came off of, from Walter Day, and then Walter Day decided to, instead of doing the Twin Galaxies one, he shifted gears and supports the International Video Game Hall of Fame as like one of their ambassadors. That's why every time they host a Hall of Fame, Walter there, everyone is given a pin. They have the ambassador. I even have one. I'm an ambassador. In fact, when you get inducted into the International Video Game Hall of Fame, there's some guidelines. You have to sign a paper and all of this stuff. They're very thorough. Shout out to Jerry Byron. That's another guy you guys need to interview there. And, uh, <laughs> International video game to him and what's this guy's name? Bill Hoffman, Dennis. There's a lot of guys you guys need to interview. Some of those guys are guys played video games in Walter's age, and they grew up and they're older now. They were there in the arcade playing games with Walter Day. So you definitely, I'm, I'm gonna definitely try to connect you to those two guys. So much history is in Ottawa, Iowa. It's crazy. You definitely have to send me an email with all those contact info. Oh, now I forgot what I wanted to say. No, no problem. No problem. Yeah. Yeah. Todd Rogers. I really would love to talk to Todd Rogers, but I guess he will not talk to anybody before this lawsuit thing has cleared up. No, that's not necessarily true. Like I said, Todd Rogers is a part of Empire Acadia. Um, people tell me that you should get rid of him because he's branded a cheater. And I'm like, no, we don't do the things like that. That's not in this organization. I don't care who branded him as a cheater because I, I, as a CEO and the founder of my organization, I did the research myself. I know Todd Rogers is not a cheater. I'm not going to throw him under the bus and I'm not going to abandon him. So I'm like, he's a part of the organization, whether people see him as a cheater or not. I, I can arrange a conversation with him, but due to legal reasons, there are some things he will not be able to talk about because it's a pending lawsuit. Obviously, his lawyer is going to say you can't discuss that. It's so pen. better, better wait, uh, probably, till this is resolved. I guess you could. Uh, I mean, I, there are things he can answer because there's things I would answer about his uh, lawsuit. Basically, we wouldn't interview him about the lawsuit, but about his history and stuff. Like we interview you about the history and stuff. And suddenly we turned into Chase Hall, but this wasn't on my planning, actually. Well, but But I emailed him. He's a part of it, though. That's the, the reason why Jason was brought up is because he, he is a part of the history in a negative way. Sad. True. True. But, uh, you can interview Todd Rogers about his history as a gamer. That he'll do that. I emailed him two years ago. He never answered me, unfortunately. Then it got lost in the email. That's a fact. Because Todd Rogers would not turn down an interview. It got lost in the email. So I, I, what I'll do is I will forward him your email and I'll say contact your piece. Trying to contact sure. you. Sure, sure. I I can forward I can forward my email sent to him to you, and forward perhaps just okay. forward it to me. Forward it to him, and then tell him he's been looking for you. This cool set of guys you need to get interviewed by. Here you back. That would sure. be nice. That would be nice. Yeah, Wonderful. <laughs> Wonderful. Have you interviewed Billy Mitchell? Also, yes. Oh, you've interviewed him already. Okay, cool. Just want to make sure. <laughs> yes, it says we interviewed a lot of guys. We interviewed Steve Wiebe, Billy Mitchell, Walter Day, Richie Knuckles. Richie Knuckles. No, what, but have you interviewed Ben Gold? Not yet, no. Yeah, that is the first legitimate commercialized video game world champion ah. in the world history, period. He, he's a kid that won That's Incredible on ABC. It's him. Yeah, and he's easy to reach. You could have asked Billy. Billy would have uh, hit up Ben. But they're all still friends. These guys grew up together. Steve Sanders, Todd Rogers, Billy Mitchell, Ben Gold, all those guys that grew up to, um, together. They're still all connected. I see. Another guy I tried to reach was 
train Johnsons, but that didn't work out either. What's his name? Train wasn't it wasn't it train Johnsons or no train Richard train Richard I think Dwayne it was train Richard oh yeah yeah train Richard yeah there's just certain people <laughs> yeah I just, <laughs> I'm not gonna advocate too much hatred <laughs> but if yeah, you want yeah. sure <laughs> yeah the thing is we try to talk to everybody but but I know there is hate between people and and oh, people. I I don't hate him because I don't know. I don't know. I've met him twice in my life, face to face. Um, in, in, in our interaction, real cool guy. What I don't like that he does is his his seething hatred for Billy is just too toxic. Because look, at his age, you would think, come on, man, it's not that important. Let's move on. But he he just doesn't. So and the things. He keeps making videos, and it's just it's just hate after hate, and it's, you just don't. There's certain people that's negative that you just aren't. You know, you because you don't want to become an enemy of theirs. It's just better if you just stay away from them. That's not anybody else. I can't speak for anyone else. That's just me. Uh, if you I'm, you got an interview with him, he doesn't know you. You're not going to get that negativity. So diverse coverage to interview him. Sit here and. Don't go interview him, but I won't sit here and tell you go interview him either. Yeah, the thing is, let's not make this part of the recording again. But uh, there is a second person like that, and that was Roy Shield. He was really uh. hard to get a hold of, and then he was really hard to work with because he was constantly implying that we would turn his words around and make edits and stuff. And no, we don't want to. We don't want to put you into bad life. We just want to know your side of the story. And it took a lot of convincing to make him understand that we are not going to go against him yeah. by releasing the interview. And, and we didn't change a word in it and so on. But he was so afraid that we would do that. That's unfortunate. <laughs> so so really I don't... totally understand that some people like... Train Richard and Roy Schild, they are really very, um, how to say, skeptical or? Very skeptical and very stand, very defensive. This is the problem. Talk with them. To sit down and reason, they're so, they have hard convictions on their point of view. And if you are not, if you do not agree with their point of view, then this is not going to work. And that's what makes it difficult. I truly try to, I try to be neutral. I really, I'm not a hater. I would, I would recommend you get an interview with Jace Hall, but Jace Hall is not going to do any interviews because of the legal climate that he's in. Another guy that I really think you should interview for the sake and the purpose of historical archiving purposes for you, Tim McVeigh. And I, I, I Oh yes, um, wasn't he? I, I know, what was was the game called? Um, Snake. Yeah, the game is called Snake. What? No, it's Nibbler, Nibbler, Nibbler. Nibbler, Nibbler. Yes, yes, yes. But, and he's he's also one of those um, controversial guys that many people dislike. I don't think Tim is dislikable. That in, I've had my run-ins with Tim over nonsense, and but like I, he, despite. I don't know what his feelings are about me, but I don't dislike him. I think he's a cool guy. I actually admire his history and what he contributed to esports all the way back in the years. But he doesn't believe that esports started in his era because his understanding of esports is completely different. He thinks esports is well. You have sponsors, advertisers. It, the games are on television. It's what's the word for this? It's structured a certain way, which commercialized. And my argument with him is like, but all of that happened in a tumble with its tech. I'm like, you can't compare. Like, it's like comparing baseball in the 1920s to baseball today. If mm. you look at it on television, you can see the core fundamental aspects of it. Okay, it's the same game, but they look different. Of course it does. The resources and the times are different. The bats and the balls and the stadiums were different back then versus the bats and the balls and the stadiums of today. I'm like, you, so I'm like, yeah, they slightly look different, but it's the same sport. And that's where me and Tim disagree on certain things. So he doesn't see it that way. 
So if it's not like the way esports is today, he doesn't count it. But I'm like, 20 years from now, esports will look nothing like esports today. It's going to change. This is what is going to happen. Like, <laughs> all, look at this example. The, all, the NBA basketball all-star game just had a new all-star game put in. You know what that new game is? Half-court shooting. They shoot from half-court now as teams. And I'm like, wait, what? 20 years, 30 years ago, when Michael Jordan was getting his first championship, you made a half-court shot? It was considered to be a one-in-a-million chance of that happening. Steph Curry pulls from half-court, spots up. He's like, turns around, looks at you, and runs up the court, and it goes in. Listen, that's not a one-in-a-million shot. You accurately shot that, yes. But you see, it's called evolution. <laughs> but it's called, it's called evolution. Things True. change, but the core fundamental principles of it remain the same. So that's me and his back and forth banter on it. But I don't personally think he's a bad guy. I think he's a, a decent person. I, I like Tim, but we've had our run-ins and whatever. But I, despite our run-ins, I would recommend an interview with him. He's too, he's too instrumental in, in, in a Tumwa uh, uh, for Iowa as a gamer not to be interviewed. Way too instrumental. This is where AJ and I disagree. I like interviewing controversial people, and AJ is always, oh no, really? Again, somebody who is controversial. Do I do that? Do I do that? Uh, yeah, you, you, you were not happy when I said, let's interview. You had your thoughts about it. Honestly, there's, there's nothing wrong. <laughs> there's nothing wrong with interviewing a controversial person as long as you can, as long as you can keep them from because i guess jay or jason hmm. what jay? jay or jason what's his name jay or jason because i never got hey. to the... oh hey. me. me me yeah you yeah, yeah a aj oh aj okay sorry okay. okay no problem aj's issue is when you interview this controversial they bring so much negativity it destroys the quality of the interview see that's yeah. usually Reason why a lot of people don't want to interview negative people. It's a what you're there for is gather information becoming a toxic mess about who the person hates, what political views he dislikes, what religion he wants to burn down, who he wants to kill. And you're like, no, we're not here for that. Like, we're just here to talk about your game. Like, come on. Man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, I agree with AJ on that. I agree with it. I had Roy Schild hanging up on me on the phone. Getting streamed on by him yeah, that I yeah. tried to yeah, manipulate no, that him. A, that was the universal thing. I think we all had that done. <laughs> I was like, man, I want to get your story out. I'm not trying to man manipulate you. I just want to get your story out. And he was totally attacking me. I was like, okay, that's the first time I'm trying to make a favor to somebody. And he screams on me and hangs up the phone. That was a first timer. That's that's what AJ is worried about. <laughs> Yeah, that's what he's <laughs> Well, pe people are different. Let's say that. But perhaps in twenty years we will have our interview with Chase Hall. Who knows? Have your interview with him after the after he works. Say that much. So hopefully he will give his side. The entire issue in the matter, and I can speak because I'm third party. The entire issue of the matter, Chase Hall implied that Billy. He implied through punishing Billy Mitchell and through his sentence of Billy Mitchell, that Billy Mitchell is a cheater. But then goes on record to say, we never call Billy Mitchell a cheater. <laughs> okay, so he's, you didn't call him a cheater. Yeah, he's not a cheater. Why'd you ban him? You yeah. See, you okay. play these stupid little mind games. You had to ban him for a reason. If you didn't ban him for cheating, then what is the reason? And if you don't have a reason, then this is malicious. Then if this is malicious, you see how this works? You see how this works? There's so much I can say on it. This one, like, this guy's cooked in court. Like, he's so cooked in court. They're going to cook him. And he's done. In fact, I think I said a little bit too much. But I'm not so sure. He didn't talk to me the five <laughs> years before the lawsuit. I'm not sure he will talk to me after the lawsuit. He's not doing any interviews, which is so sad because I would like to get the modern Twin Galaxies also covered. But if it's well, not I, happening, it's not happening. I can give you 
insight on the modern Twin Galaxies cover. Because when Jace Hall was building the new infrastructure for Twin Galaxies, I was in, I was in, you know, he wasn't involved. I watched him build it. So my observation, I have input on it. When they were attacking me for my Guinness World Records, I spoke directly to David Hawksett, Jace Hall. I even had involvements with a gentleman called um, Stephen Daltrey from Guinness and Mike Plant emails. I, there's so much stuff that I know and so much things that I know, which is why I'm one of the people who will be testifying in defense of Billy and Walter because I have so much dirt. Oh man, these guys should have just, that's why they needed to get me. They had to get me. If they didn't get me, <clears throat> they need to get me to make me guilty so that the things that I have to say and the things that I have to show as evidence would be dis discredited. But they tried to get me. They're never going to get me because I didn't cheat, period. And then there's things that they did in their organization, which is so filthy. I used to be the Mortal Kombat world champion in terms of the world record. And these guys literally wrote on the modern Twin Galaxies forms of Jace Hall's Twin Galaxies. The guy's like, we know Triforce cheated. There's no way he could have gotten that score without cheating. So they said, let us just file a report that he cheated. Force him to defend his score. He has to then show the tactic that he used to get the score. And if he doesn't, then some other guy who put in a, a new score who broke the rules. And I'm like, you can't do that. You continue. You're cheating. And there's, so what? Force the score through anyway. So it forces mm -hmm. me to show the tactic of how I did it. So I'm like, but then you're committing fraud in Twin Galaxies. In broad daylight. I'm like, so you're going to let a, a score. You all know he broke a rule to get the score in. You're going to force the score in. So this is an illegal score going in just so I tell my secret. So I said, no, I'm not going to do that. And Twin Galaxies should not allow that score to go in because it broke the rules. Twin Galaxies let the score go in. I said, really? I, what? I so never, I never. Let the score go in. And I was like, wow. So at that point, I was like, I'm, that's what made me go, I'm done with this administration. Because this, this is a witch hunt. They try to come after me for my Mortal Kombat score. They try to come after me to my Contra score. They try to come after me to my Versus Super Mario Brothers score, where there are rules being broken in that game. One second. There are rules being broken in that game to get the high score. I don't even argue the rule. I just say, as long as they don't touch my record on the rule, I won't say anything about it because I'm not trying to make this a, a big thing. But the moment they touch my record on that rule, it's a wrap. I called Twin Galaxies. I spoke to David Hawkset in email and in video and said, you guys are allowing this cheating thing to happen. Triforce, you should submit a ticket in saying that they're cheating. And I'm like, no, this is happening. This is happening in real time. As the administrators, you should stop it from happening before it goes in. You telling me, allow the... I see some guys packing a bag full of guns and I was across the street with my phone like this and they're like this. We're going to go down to Jerk 3rd and Wall Street. We're going to rob the bank. I need you to cover this. Here's a sniper gun. You see the guy receiving a sniper gun. I want you to take the top on this and they're packing bombs and all this. I call the police. I submit the tape to the police. They're going to go rob a bank down at Wall Street. They got the sniper. They have the whole plan. The police go like this. We can't do anything until after they rob the bank. What? So you're gonna you're gonna let them commit the crime first? All the we have evidence that shows them plant stop. That's like you get evidence on a terrorist organization gonna do something, and you have all the evidence that you do nothing to stop the terrorist organization. You wait for them to bomb a place and kill people first before you go after them. No. So that's what Jace is doing in his organization. That's what he is allowed to be done in his organization, at least with me. So there's so much dirt and stuff that I know about what he's done because of my inter in intimate um, relationship with Todd Rogers, what he did to Todd Rogers, what he did to Billy Mitchell, and the stuff that I had to dig up to help them in their defense case. So there's a lot I know about the organization, period. And I don't care if they burn it down either, because as far as I'm concerned, they burnt down Twin Galaxies already. By going after Walter, they, they even created a lawsuit to sue Walter. 
I think Good. HA, you Good. made the point once that you said, I think to me, that there should be an independent entity yeah. for, yeah. I, I for the I score. That, that, yeah. that Twin Galaxy shouldn't be the official gatekeeper of who what the scores are, who holds high scores. What needs to happen is that Walter, well, Walter doesn't want it anymore. Honestly, he, that's the whole. That was the whole reason of him selling it to Jason. But Jason needs to be removed from it. A, a new arbiter needs to come and take over. Honestly, and just start fresh. What should have happened is what I recommended to Walter when he was selling Twin Galaxies. Take the top 100 scores of all time from the arcades that they cherished that as a part of the arcade Illuminati history. Grandfather them put them in a vault and said that those are the scores set up a whole new database and regiment for the incoming scores this way no none of the old people who grew up can bring their negative vitriol to try to challenge anything that's been grandfathered this is it guys where the new twin galaxies is going into a new field we're bringing in the xbox series one nintendo switch all the new games this is what it is you don't like it that's your problem find a way to beat those scores or leave it alone. That's it. We're not gonna. We're not gonna risk destroying the in, integral history of Twin Galaxies because of your moping and crying. Jace Hall grossly. Gro it was a gross. Um, his gross negligence has led to the decay of Twin Galaxies. He cannot sit there and say, "Oh, it's not his fault," because this is happening under his administration. And who fostered this? Who? Who led this? Who decided to make? public and put on variety magazine and and all of these other things that pr have it printed in the guinness book billy mitchell and todd rogers the records that was not who allowed this to happen jace hall mm. he allowed twin galaxies to literally decompose it just it just spoiled and to appease who a handful of Nine children that grew up that don't like Billy and Todd or Walter. On the other hand, you have to say to their credit that those people who challenged Todd Watchers and Billy Mitchell scores, they actually, I think it was MAME, they actually made videos saying that the way MAME displays the uh, Donkey Kong board is different than the arcade what? machine, and that is why he cheated. So they I, provided some evidence, at least. No, they did not. It is not evidence. Okay, I, I say this, let's have this discussion. I say this like I said this to other people before. They challenged one of my scores. There's a game called Black Tiger. The ACAM at Fun Spot was hosting events, and they wanted to become the largest video game museum in the world. So they're asking people to set to donate arcades that they didn't want. Don't throw them away, donate their arcades to um, Funspot and they were gonna enshrine it in Funspot forever, okay? One of the games I was good at was a game called Black Tiger. So I ordered a Black Tiger machine from an arcade creator in California. I paid $1,500 for that arcade. And I told them, ship the arcade to Funspot, where I would then go to Funspot and then I would try to go for a high score on that game. They shipped the arcade to Funspot. Funspot has a, his name is called Gary Vincent. He's the technician for the uh, place. Also a, a lady there as well, who's a, also a technician. I don't know if she still works there, but Gary Vincent was a technician at the time. When I got there, if you go to Funspot, you know, it says this arcade machine was donated by Empire Arcadia. I never got my hands on the arcade. My hands never touched the arcade. I just had it, I ordered it and had it shipped there. They shipped the arcade there. I went there, Walter Day came in. The game had Japanese settings on it. Walter Day, who's the arbiter of Twin Galaxies, tells Gary Vincent to open the machine and set the settings to match the settings that they had in the um, pinball, video game and pinball, because they had a book for it. It's a blue book and there's a yellow one. So they have the switches and the different settings set up for the actual game. So he, he asks Gary, fix it so that it can get as close to the settings as possible so that I can play and set a world record on the game. I said, sure, no problem. Well, Gary said, sure, no problem. He fixes it. I play the game a little bit so we can make sure, okay, when you buy this, this cost, when you attack this, point this from this, everything was good. So Walter said, this is sanctioned, play. Did you know when I played that I set that record was in that game for 
almost 10 years. It stayed in the game for almost 10 years. For someone to say, Triforce cheated on Black um, Dragon, on Black Tiger. I said, how? We find out that the score that I got on that game is not possible in Black Tiger. He's, what's going on? There's like, how is he getting 2 million points? The most you can get is 1,700,000, 1,800,000. You can't get 2,600,000. So they found out that there's a counterpart to a Japanese version of it called Black Dragon. Where when you kill the dragon in the end of the game, you're awarded a million points. In the U.S. version of the game, of the ROM, you don't get a million points for killing the dragon. So I was playing Black Dragon on a Black Tiger arcade machine. I didn't know. Walter didn't know. And the mechanic at the time didn't know. Did I cheat? Good point. I don't know. What do you think, AJ? Stop there. Full stop. Now, Billy Mitchell is given an arcade game to compete in at these events where he goes to play Donkey Kong. I told this to Jace Hall before he went after Billy. Jace, stop the bullshit. You and I both know there are things called bootleg ROMs in arcades. Any arcade gamer knows this. Like, remember the Street Fighter machines where the where you can do Hadouken and five fireballs come out? There's, there's these bootleg ROMs. Why? Because these are old analog machines. When you repair them, you can't find the semi-transistors and conductors that were built in 1981 or whatever. So you find the next closest one that gives it as best as possible to you. Man vs. Snake, the movie with Dwayne Richards. Someone went in the machine and there was a transistor that made his game one second faster than Tim McVeigh's. So he's going through the games faster than Tim McVeigh's. So he finished his game. Okay, did Dwayne Richard build a machine? No. Steve Weeby. Oh, there are gummy substance on the board. We don't know what happened. Did Steve Weeby build a machine? No. Why are you blaming the gamers who are playing on the machine? It's unless they built the machine themselves and brought it and then they found out that there's something wrong with the machine, then the player cheated because they are responsible for the machine. But if they did not do that, how can they be responsible for the machine? Number two, another one. If, let's say, the creator of the game, because one of Billy Mitchell's things is, the Donkey Kong board that he got was from Nintendo. They certified the board. There's evidence of Nintendo certifying the board. If Nintendo certifies the board, let's say Nintendo got the board back and said, all right, look, we ain't got time to find those tra transistors. Let's give it a main version. Let's use a main ROM version to it. For instance, did you know that the Pac-Man in the anniversary edition is different from the Pac-Man in the modern one, which is different from the original Pac-Man? There are upgraded versions of these boards based on the technology. All the creator cares about is that it plays 99% to the accuracy of the game. These little things they don't care about because they don't care about the score in that capacity. That's why Billy Mitchell was able to beat the perfect Pac-Man score that he set because in the anniversary version, it was slightly different. But when you play the game, but it plays just like Pac-Man though. Yeah, but there's a slight difference because they added one different converter transformer that added to this other game because in the anniversary version, Galaga's in it and, Mar uh, and Pac-Man's in it. So because of that, there's this one little micro switch that made the thing. So another dot pops up so you can beat the score technically. Okay, so then that means Billy cheated? No, that's how they built it. So I'm like, you are blaming this on the creation of the game. Mm -hmm. Like you're blaming Todd Rogers when the creator's like, the games were defaulting. How are you gonna blame Todd Rogers? So I'm like, they did not cheat. That's why I said, put the asterisk. The asterisk means due to technology of the time, you grandfather that score, make a whole new database for the error of the time. Because it's not fair, you will never be able to play in the same circumstances and the same technology that they played back then. So you're giving a new age an, an opportunity to play in the new era. But don't punish the guys from yesterday. It's not their fault. Jace knows this. Mm. I did it anyway. I did it anyway. So when it came to my Black Dragon game, they oh, it's a Black Dragon ROM. But Walter was like, I'm the one who had... First of all, Walter doesn't know anything about transistors of the game. He's just the adjudicator. 
he tells the technician to go fix the game. The technician fixes the game in the best mm -hmm. of his ability. Uh, Gary Vincent doesn't make Black Tiger or Black Dragon. All he can do is flip the dip switches to matches what's in the book. This is what's called human error. You cannot blame nothing to cheat means mm -hmm. It's premeditated. You come up with a plan. You know what you're going to do to get the score the way you want the score to be. It's premeditated. All of the instances that I just said, there are no premeditation in it. So no one cheated. So if no one cheated, you cannot punish them. <laughs> the only way you can punish them for it is if you're being malicious. So by you, your logic, the reason why Richie Knuckles, who is a technician, never talks about his opinion about Donkey Kong's cheating. Could be that he doesn't know better or he made a mistake back then? No, I don't think Billy, um, uh, Richie Knuckles won't go through that because there are other instances in the Donkey Kong community where based on what Richie Knuckles knows and the rules, there are other cheaters in the Donkey Kong community. But circumstance it's not like these guys was like help me cheat richie or anything like that circumstance things richie's like oh shit didn't know but you can't blame them this is an unknown and like these are situations and you deal with them at the time so richie isn't richie isn't a malicious person so he understands that his opinion can sway other opinions of certain things all that needs to be known is this This was not the intentions of the players. And whatever happens, or these were the intentions of some players, but these were not the intentions of other players. So the best thing for Richie to do is, I don't have a comment. I, I, I could be wrong. That may not even be the reason why Richie doesn't even comment on it. He may just like, I just don't want to comment on it, period. But <laughs> for me, these things were not taken into consideration. And when these guys go out and do these things, this has mm. to be malicious because it's like, why aren't you taking these human elements into consideration? Why? Because they need a bad guy. They need a <laughs> cheat. They have to find one. They have to ostracize them. And they have to make an event out of it. They have to create drama. All of this is malicious behavior. And it is provable. You can prove it. Because mm. if they knew all of this information, so then why would you do this if you know this information? If you know this bootleg, is it? The first question, is it possible that Billy did not know that the machine was tampered with or made a certain way that it was going to play that way? Yeah, because Billy's not an arcade creator. Mm. None, none of us know all of that. You have to prove that we know we're an arcade creator. And you can't prove that because none of us are certified. None of us went to any of the schools for it. So getting a certified technician to say, yeah, he should have known. Stupid. That's an astronaut mm. saying a person who wants to come to NASA to try out and be an astronaut, you should have known that. No, you shouldn't. You should know. I think to settle that, I think it's a bit probably comparable to getting your car repaired and then you challenge the technician of the car repair guy saying you did it wrong or... Exactly. You just drive the car. You don't make it. You don't repair the car. You just drive the car. So imagine yeah. you do it. The technician like, nah, when you, before you lift up your hood and spark plug in here. The guy was like, why would I know that? It's your car. Yes, I bought it so I could drive it. I didn't buy it so I could mm -hmm. disassemble it and put it together and know how the car works. I don't buy my Nintendo Switch so I can open it to find out how Nintendo made the Switch and how it works. I bought it to play the video game on it. That alone should have ended the case between Billy Mitchell, should have ended the case between Todd Rogers. Prime example. Well, today, They found out that something was wrong with Steve Weeby's game. Did Walter Day say, Steve Weeby, you cheated. You are out. You're black. You're... If, if Walter Day wanted to protect Billy Mitchell's score, all he could have said, due to the fact that we found out that you did this based on our opinion on it, you're done and you're banned from Twin Galaxy forever. They didn't. They just didn't accept the score. based on. And then Walter said, you're welcome to try again. He didn't say you can't. Billy Mitchell's turn, Jace Hall, you're banned from the Twin Galaxies database mm. for life. And we're removing all of your records for Guinness for life. But you're Tot gonna... Totally get your point. Totally get your point, yeah. And I'm sitting here like, how are you people arguing against this simple logic? It's a simple logic. This is not some scientist. You go to court with this and you sit down in the court and you go, 
they're going to yeah that's being malicious what walter did was the right thing to do even if walter let's say deep down in walter's heart he thought steve weeby was cheating he was a consummate professional and said we can't definitively prove that you cheated so the best we can do is not validate your score allow you to do another score again the next score if you beat the current score that you have, we will validate the first score because you have shown us you have the ability to get that score so we will recognize your first score and we will accept your new score as the new world record he gave him the benefit of the doubt mm. Todd Rogers was given a disingenuous benefit of doubt. Hey, can you do what you did 30 years ago at 16 that took you two years to do in three days on live television in a recorded thing on a different... We'll make it as close as we can possibly. So you want me to repeat the same anomaly on a close to whatever? That was so disingenuous. I even told Todd Rogers before, don't go, Todd. That's a setup. There's no way you're going to win that. You will need God on your... God will have to come down and touch you on your shoulder and say, be one with my son in order for that to happen. You're being set up. I'm like, you cannot win that. That is a setup. So I said, True. you technology at your side. Send them the brute force. It was Jace Hall who came up with the idea. That we'll just have them brute force the game. That's what he said to Todd Rogers. We'll have them brute force the game, find out that your time is not even the fastest time. And once they do that, then boom, you're exonerated. When they went on the show, they didn't brute force the game. So you lied to Todd. So I went out and got the brute force myself, which then I showed to Twin Galaxies and they removed it. I was like, oh. So I uploaded it to my YouTube and I kept a copy to myself. So I said, okay, I see how we're playing these games. So you have the evidence. I said, so you just want Todd to be guilty. So I said, oh, I get it. And these are the things people do not know. And it's going to go to court. And when it goes to court, I'm going to give up all of these things. I made sure everyone have a copy. So in case I suddenly die for whatever reason, <laughs> And whatever, they're going to clap Jace Hall in court. Let's hope you don't die so fast. Yeah, you never know. And I, I'm not, the evidence does not go with me to the grave. I, there's seven different people with the evidence. Billy has it. Walter has it. Todd has it. I have it. A couple of other secret people have it. And I have it in a secret um, vault. So, yeah, he's cooked pretty much. What we should at least do at some point in the future is talking perhaps with some female parts of your organization about the female side of gaming, because that's something that we didn't cover yet, at least from the casual female gaming side that you mentioned. No, they, 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 they play professionally as well. It's just that what, what we do for TV, we promote the casual uh, side on Twitter. Ah, okay. Ah, okay. You mean for... Yeah, okay. We have one of them, I'm Robin. She's, we call her our captain commander. She com she competes. She sets world records. She went to Evo. She competes in actual video game tournaments. Empress Nile is retired now because she's the head of the Valkyries. She literally runs the division and manages it. She also is a TV show host for Wayne on the live video game TV. So she cannot play competitively anymore because it will require her to be on the games 24-7. So she just creates content on gaming. But she hosts esports events like the Just Dance Just Dance Off 2022 by the Long Island Gaming League. She was the person who hosted the event. So she does that. And we have a couple of other uh, people. We have Lady Thunder. She, oh man, Lady Thunder is uh, one of our retro gods. You definitely need to interview her. I'm gonna definitely put you onto her. She does no death runs on old school NES, Master System games and arcade games. And her husband- Sounds interesting. Yeah, yeah her husband, Rudy Chavez. They, they, all, they all have records in get, um, Twin Galaxies as well. So these guys are like old school people. So we have girls in the organization that compete competitively and professionally, but we also have girls that are do the casual thing and whatnot, which we believe will help lay out the foundation for girls to have a platform. What stops girls from coming in to gaming and taking it seriously is that unlike guys, they're not given a casual platform to walk in and feel comfortable playing. Guys, mm -hmm. we got that. But girls, if they come in, you suck! Rah! Rah! So they're like... Oh, <laughs> so we want to provide that platform where they come in, have a good time, play some video games. Because when you let them come in and have a good time and play video games, they develop their own competitive spirit in the game. I've seen these girls playing Mario Party and get into arguments and fights and over Mario Party. So the competitive spirit in the but you have to let them feel comfortable. And let's keep it real. 
not you or me, but we as guys don't make it comfortable for girls to come in. We just don't. Whether we're sexually harassing them or we're shitting on them in the video games. We're always down on them about something. And I don't, me personally, I don't like that because I would hate to then have a daughter and then some guys talking to my daughter over the phone, you trash and blah, blah, blah. I yeah. would have to get and then I'm gonna fuck them up and I'm gonna then I'm gonna teach I'm gonna act to them the way they act to my daughter. You suck, your mother. <laughs> and all these other stuff that they do, and that's that's unbecoming of me. So I'm like, all right, I don't wanna do that to anybody's ch children or anybody's daughter. So no one should do that to my children or my daughter. So let us help them build something for them. We never took the time in the last 30 years to build anything for gaming for girls. Really, honestly. We never took that. And I'm not talking about make games, like culture-wise. We grew up, we had the arcades. We could go to our friend's house and play video games. Girls at the time, it took the tomboy girl to go into the arcade who was actually good at the game. And she was acting like the guys. When she beat them, she'd be yelling at the guys or whatever. You suck in data. But the average girl just didn't fit in there. They were home playing Barbie or they had their boyfriend going out or whatever it is that they were doing. They didn't. Hmm what we have now what we have the internet we have online gaming lobbies and stuff like that this is the opportunity for girls that's why girls you're looking at the market girls consume half the market of video games than they are their big their arcades is online and they don't have to go into a room full of dudes they can go into a room full of girls now like the valkyries they play pokemon unite as a girl group and sometimes they do unisex. Sometimes they get their friend stated average or they get their friend Rashawn. So two of the guys on the five-man team will be guys and then the rest will be girls. Or it'll be four girls, one guy. And, and, and the guys like playing with the girls. They go, this is different. I like playing with the girls, it's fun. Or whatever the case may be, because even the guys, well, we're older now and we're tired of the young cursing, screaming, yelling, you suck <laughs> nonsense. We're older now, we're like, the first thing we say when we hear that is like, how old are you? Because you, you can't be our age doing that. <laughs> you have to be like some teen kid doing that. And then you find out, I'm 19, and you go, oh, okay, so, yeah, uh, obviously. And you let it pass because they're kids. Mm. But, yeah. Totally get your point. So, we covered a lot today. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Thanks so mm. much for your time. It's so, so interesting. So interesting. Um, so, so where, where can people go and find your stuff? I need to organize my stuff. I'm all over the place. Um, <laughs> you guys can find me on YouTube. Help my YouTube page reach 30,000. It's at 29,000. It's at youtube.com um, backslash Empire Arcadia. One word spelled as is. And you can also find me on my Twitter. These are two main places I'm on, um, YouTube and Twitter. You can find me on Twitter at EMP underscore Triforce underscore GM. So um, it, on those um, on my YouTube, you'll see the history of Empire Acadia. Then and now, there's a section at the bottom called the the G of esports, and I pretty much anything I feel that's important, I put it there. That's like the history of esports, and it goes all the way back. And I even put some of my African features there as well, just because it's, it's a part of the history and so forth. I saw that already. Awesome. Yeah. Well, and we didn't even cover so much is missing. <laughs> that's a sad. We can do a follow up at some point in the future. Yeah. No problem. No problem. I'm down for it because there's so much. Uh, Walter, Walter said, I'm what he said. He asked me if I'm going to take over for him when he, when he finally is um, gone. I was like, maybe. Uh, carry the history with me. Well, it's not good though. I need to. That's not true. I document the history. I document the history on my Empire Acadia channel. Everything I just try to document as much as I can. Walter's not so old yet. He can still make it a few years. So, well, no, nah, I, th I give Walter 20 years. Yeah. Walter, he does transcendental meditation. He doesn't eat garbage. He's a vegetarian. Walter can make it. He can make it to 90. We are like 20 old years from now. 70 by the time passes. And I think Walter can make it to 100. You see? The oldest Pac Man player or something. Yeah. yeah. Actually, I think he'd be the oldest gamer in the world. I think Walter is the oldest gamer in the world. Who knows? I don't know. The reason why I say that, Ralph Bear died. Oh, but what, did Ralph Bear died in the 70s or his 80s? Put it like this. If Walter makes it to 90, he would definitely be the oldest gamer in the world. Ever. 
But he told me he doesn't game anymore since uh, then. See, what, one of the things I don't like about Walter is his modesty. Walter does not game in the sense that Walter does not go home and pick up a video game and play. Invite Walter to a convention and put a mix tracks machine there. He goes, oh, mix tracks. And he goes over there and he starts playing. So don't listen to Walter with stuff like that. Because he still does that today. Uh, like, like, even today. Last convention, mix tracks. There's interviews. Like last year, Walter playing mix tracks and he's talking to people. So he just doesn't play video games in a sense of like how we play video games. And okay. Like, so Walter is a casual gamer. That's just not a pro game. I'm a shitty gamer. I, I always lose. I'm better at, at doing <laughs> interviews, so. <laughs> I don't think yeah, well. so. I'm good as a game that you're good at. But I, got, <laughs> but I got my own arcade machine, so I'm happy. See, there you go. And I'm sure you, you know, have some games. So when I moved in into my flat, it was either a sofa or an arcade machine. It's better. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so, so far. There's the one thing I like about arcade machines especially the 1980 ones, is uh, this is a thing that, like, it's because I grew up in it. Gallagher, Donkey Kong, Popeye, Pac-Man, all of those great machines. When you go into an arcade and you just hear all of those games running at the same time, not the newer machines. It has to be the old ones from the 80s. There's a certain nos nosol nostalgic... You know what it reminds me of? You know when kids, when you're a baby, they buy those little things, that, those melody machines that and, and they're having the toys. For us, that was our melody machine. <laughs> Old guys just kept walking to an arcade and when you hear the... Dun -dun -dun, when you hear the Gallagher startup song and you just, you just automatically get hit with the nostalgia and you're like, you just get relaxed. That's what happened. I don't know. Does that happen to you guys? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I totally get what you mean, yes. Yeah. It happens every time I walk into an old-school arcade uh, uh, machine. That th Those sounds, are just those were our lullabies of the age. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys. Thank you guys for having me. I appreciate yes, it. Yes, thank you for being with us. Thanks a lot. Uh, would you, okay? Awesome. <laughs> okay. Talk to you uh, then. Bye-bye. Thank you, no sir. Bye-bye.